This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. So I'm calling the finance committee meeting of the town council 2020 and welcome everybody um, here. Uh, pursuant to uh, Governor Baker's uh, March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law, chapter 38, section 18, this meeting of the finance committee, it should be safe finance up there, is being conducted by a remote participation. And um, in order to satisfy the rules of remote participation, I'm gonna quickly go through the members of the committee who are present just so that they confirm as I call their names and they respond that um, they hear me and I can hear them. Uh, so, Lynn Griesner? Lynn? On mood? Here. here. Okay, Kathy Shane? I'm here. Dorothy Pam? Here. Beth Angelos? Here. Uh, then Bob Hegner? Here. And uh, Mary Lou Tomlin? Here. Okay, so, um, Sharon Povinelli is not present. We have five members, uh, all five members who are council members of the committee um, are present, which constitutes the quorum. And uh, we confirm that everybody can hear and be heard. What you see momentarily, just for the moment on your screen is the agenda for today's meeting. Um, I just want to um, explain Two things. One is for any members of the public who are watching the meeting, we're going to be talking about budgets, and you can find information about budgets on the town website. Uh, and that is uh, just when you get to the open page, um, look under uh, government for budget, and you should see a list of budget documents, including the FY21 proposed budget, from the town manager, and uh, I believe that it either has or links to the library and school budgets. And uh, so with that note, the other thing that I wanted to just alert you to is the order in which we're going to take <clears throat> the agenda that's before you at the moment. And it is basically what's on the screen except for number two is going down and becoming uh, after library budget. So it'll be uh, elementary school budget, library budget, then um, going back to uh, the presentation from last night and uh, general questions about the budget, not specific to departments, but overview um, for the town budget. We will be in a series of meetings over the next uh, week and a half, um, this Thursday and then um, next week for a couple of days in the day in the following day having finance committees every tuesday and thursday in which we will be taking segments of the budget and asking questions about segments of the budget so um is, if there are any questions about this um let me know otherwise uh, why don't we go ahead and uh introduce uh superintendent morris and uh uh, invite the superintendent to uh, make whatever uh, introductory comments that he or Doug Slaughter have uh, to introduce the budget to us. Great. Thank you very much. And thanks to the Finance Committee for having me. And thanks for your flexibility on my timing. We found out this morning we have this a meeting and it's about 35 minutes away uh, from, from now. So I appreciate your flexibility so I could be present to um, briefly chat with you and then certainly answer any questions that uh, any committee member has. Um, before I turn over to Dr. Slaughter, if he has some things he wants to share, again, I'll keep it brief so there's more dialogue possible because of my timeline. But 
Uh, the thing I want to note is we came in with a budget um, in March uh, that was considered by the school committee that was significantly higher than what the budget that's being presented today. And that was, as we know, because of uh, the financial implications of COVID. Uh, one of the challenges the schools face, as well as all town departments, is we have the financial challenges. So uh, the reduction from our uh, March budget to the budget that's here now is uh, a significantly different number um, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, less. And I think the other challenge we had is we don't know exactly what fall is looking like. As you know, we're having school committee meetings pretty much every week uh, where we're um, gathering more information. And the one thing we know is that we're going to need lots of staffing um, because we're going to be in, in some models in person and perhaps some models online at least for some students, and, and that's gonna require us to have the full complement of staffing. So we really approached this budget reduction uh, that we had to make that was near half a million dollars, uh, a little higher as I recall, as how do we maintain our staffing levels so that we have the widest range of offerings for our students in this incredibly unusual time. We know how critical in particular elementary schools and being in person for elementary schools are for students and families. And so we had to make some different decisions that we would make in a typical school year. One thing you'll notice is that uh, we um, pulled from our school choice reserve fund. So we get $5,000 plus a special ed increment uh, for any school choice student that's come in. We've built up a healthy balance and we've never touched that even in other years where we've had to make reductions. This is not any other year where we've had to make reductions. So you will see that we're pulling from that fund. In other words, we're, we'll be using more school choice funds than we'll take in next year. And we think we've done that in a way where we can phase that out over the next couple of years, but this is an extraordinary circumstance. And we felt like we needed to maintain our staffing levels to provide the best education for our students in this, in this climate. Um, I would really wanna thank the town for continuing to work with us on this. Um, there's just all sorts of nuance, both at the region and at the elementary and how they either work well together or don't work well together depending on the moment. And so I really wanna thank Sean and Paul and uh, Sonia and everyone on the town side for kind of understanding some of the nuances of having a multi-district consortium that get to share or uh, get to share sounds maybe too optimistic, but are forced to share uh, Dr. Slaughter and myself uh, for some of this work. Um, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Slaughter if he has other, any other introductory comments. But again, I, I think we're going to try to be brief so that it can be much more interactive before I have to depart. So uh, we, we figured brevity on presentation and more dialogue better than the other way around. But I'll turn it over to Dr. Slaughter. Um, I don't really have anything else to add to that. I mean, I do think, you know, we, we thought we were uh, in the halcyon days before uh, COVID hit. We, we thought we had a pretty nice budget year coming up, um, but then obviously things have changed in a significant way. And I think um, we'll be revisiting our budget. The thing I would suggest is that it's likely given how the planning between now and the start of school and even during the school year, how that plays out will make a, a significant impact on our budget and our choices we make, and it'll impact uh, what and how we have our our costs uh, distributed throughout that that budget, so we'll probably come back to talk to you about that. Hopefully, uh, you know, from a funding standpoint, we'll have some resources available to us uh, in addition to what we've already uh, been made aware of uh, that will allow us to to meet the needs of the students the way we'd like to. But um, it's it's going to be a pretty open question for a while, and so we'll have to sit with some discomfort and and uh, probably revisit these budgets quite a bit during the year in an, in an atypical way. Yeah. If I could add to that briefly, and then I really will stop talking so we can have dialogue. I think uh, some of this is on the uh, staff side, but some of that's also on the op some of this is on the operational side. So, for instance, one of the things that we're working on is uh, we know in terms of increasing ventilation, that's going to increase our heating and cooling costs and our HVAC costs. Um, so we're trying to figure out how do we factor in that uh, in a COVID world. Uh, you know, um, and this is a painful one because we we try to use the ASHRAE measures and, and try to balance. Uh, ventilation and cost as ASHRAE, uh, which is the code, encourage us to do so, that's not going to really be, we can't follow that code this year. Uh, it's not in the best interest of the health of our students and, and staff. Another variable we don't know the answer to yet is transportation. Uh, we have no information from the state on how many students can be on a bus. That'll have huge implications for cost for us, um, because right now different states are looking at this really differently and the kind of the ranges are, are huge about that and if we're able to get 12 kids on a bus versus 24 kids on a bus, that'll have implications, but we usually get 57 kids on a bus at the elementary level. So all of these are factors that are unknown costs right now. 
Uh, so we're trying to do the best we can to understand where the cost centers are. Um, the, one of the reasons I have to go in, in a bid is that the state uh, has indicated they're opening up additional um, financial resources, but not for staffing. So we're trying to find out what it's for, because that was a surprise in the state guidance document that came out on Thursday. And a bunch of people like me and Dr. Sawyer are like, oh, well, how is this used? What are the strings attached? And we had no information. So uh, they are responsive. Uh, sometimes they didn't give us too much time to get ready for a meeting, but uh, you know when it was, but they are responsive. And uh, all of this is very much in flux um, as the state board meeting, there was a, a board of education meeting at the state level this morning. And I think a lot of opinions expressed. And the thing that we keep on hearing from the state is we have to be nimble. And uh, that felt better three weeks ago than it feels right now. And it's probably gonna feel worse three weeks from now when we still have to be nimble, but I think that's actually accurate that as, uh, as where our planning goes, as we get more guidance from the state, and frankly, as the numbers across our region, if they stay where they are or they change, we're gonna have to change our plans. And that's why with the school committee, we, we've been doing uh, really important, they've been wonderful, they've really important public work of engaging the community. We've, you know, people are getting survey fatigue, so we hear that and we still want their opinions. Um, and uh, that will continue over the summer months. Uh, with that, I'll stop and open up for any dialogue that folks would like to have. Well, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. And I think uh, one thing that I want to do before I call on the first person to uh, uh, ask questions is to uh, just acknowledge that uh, Doug and Mary Lou and I had a prior service together on the old finance committee and uh, work lived through the 2008 to 2010 period. And uh, it's, it's as tough as that was, and it was pretty bad. I think this year, in my experience, has just been incredibly more difficult. And I really appreciate uh, how everybody in uh, financial and administrative positions has worked with us as a council to make this um, work of a, uh, and, and I know it has not been easy. And so we thank you for um, trying to work, um, make sure that we all work together to make it work. Uh, and so with that, uh, I was going to see Mary Lou, uh, you've given some thought to it. Did you have two or three introductory questions you wanted to start with? If not, I'm going to move it along. Not particularly. I, I thought maybe uh, Mike was kind of going to just give a, bro a broad overview of the budget. Um, and I think those will answer, the, the, you know, the questions uh, that I have, mostly looking at the, um, you know, just the, some of the uh, differences or what looks like substantial differences uh, in, in the numbers on the two pages that we received earlier. Other than that, um, and, I, and they're explainable, obviously, but I think if you're not familiar with it, um, it would be helpful. But other than an overview and then looking at those, those two documents we received from you, um, I think we're fine. I'd be, if the chair would like, I'd be happy to go over um, a document that describes some of the differences between the March budget and where we are today. Um, I just was trying to balance time of me talking versus time of uh, dialogue. And if I got that wrong, I'm happy to, to uh, detour. Why don't we hold it for a minute and let's come back and uh, let me uh, ask if there are questions, because I have about four different hands up for members of the committee and see what their questions are and then come back to the uh, point that Mary Lou is raising, which is I think really in the additions and, um, in deletions pages where you um, show the changes uh, and I think you did it in a very clear fashion and appreciate that. Um, Kathy, could you mm -hmm. you, 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 you uh, yes. hear it. So when we get to it later, it's not a comparison of the earlier one to the new one. It's just what is on the present um, list when we get back to those questions. Okay, I, I, I just have um, uh, a few that 
uh, play to you, what you've already laid out is a lot of uncertainty. Um, so um, one thing we heard, I think it was last night from Paul, is that we're likely, um, we're expecting to get a health insurance bonus because we've had such slow uses. That, I'm not seeing that yet in your budget, correct? Would that be correct? And it sounded like, Paul, you were saying that we might get as much as one month for, I won't call it free, because we, we earned it. But so that, that would play into a decrease in expense in what you're projecting, correct? Would that be, yes? Yes, it's not in the budget that was voted by the school committee because they voted the budget well before Paul received this information. But it, that is welcome good news that we have not had enough of over the last few months. And I think when we think about the additional expenses and where the funding is going to come from, I think that very well, if it plays out to fruition, uh, really support us with some of those un unanticipated expenses that we know are going to happen. Absolutely. And I, I'm asking that because I did some very quick math and you're a little bit over what we had said as an absolute flat budget. And, and that would bring you, I think, right in line with the flat budget without, without going back in at all. You so know? actually, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, That's I'd okay. actually like to respond to that if I could, if the chair would yeah. allow that. Sure. I would actually argue that we're slightly below a flat budget because uh, our original budget was uh, above two and a half percent because of the way the town manages charter and, and choice costs. So we had over 2.5% because we had a reduction in those costs. And so we actually took a larger decrease than other town departments because we had more funds that were slated to come in that weren't related to that. Other years, we've had an increase in charter costs. Our increases have been at 1.9% when the other departments were getting 2.5, which totally makes sense. I understand the accounting mechanism, uh, but I would uh, respectfully offer a different opinion that we were uh, we did not receive as much of a reduction or we were above level services because that's about money already paid. That's about charter and choice students that we already are known quantity and it's how the district and town uh, exchange funds, which is consistent with DOR. Um, so I just want to offer a respectfully different uh, perspective on that. It just, it just shows up. It's not a lot of money, but it just right. shows up as not exactly the same as flat dollars. Um, right. So then on, on where where uncertainty is on terms of your projected revenues. You're counting on the UMass um, allocation to you. Do you actually have that or is that you know expected on like July 1st as in tomorrow? Um, and so that was one of the questions because it's $170,000 and it's uh, clearly it's a big help in the budget if you get that. Yep, so I can, I can speak to this in the town manager if you chooses to, can, I'm happy to have him jump in. So that money goes to the town and then to the schools. Um, it doesn't go directly to the schools because that's the relationship is between the town and UMass. And because there's some uncertainty, as you noted in the future and our fiscal year improved because of our conservative, we made a lot of conservative decisions fiscally after March 13th or starting on March 13th, uh, where we did not need to rely on the money. The money was supposed to start this fiscal year. Um, and we were reassured from UMass that this, the funds for this fiscal year were good. Um, so instead of accepting the funds this year, we are going to accept the funds that come to the town in this fiscal year for FY21 because of that uncertainty and because we felt like we were able to squeak by this year without needing those funds in the current fiscal year. So I think you're right to say the future of those funds is, uh, I'm optimistic, but it's not certain, uh, but we received a, a a very clear email that the funds for FY20 were certain. Um, so it'll go through the town and then be filtered to us for FY21. So that actually was related to a related question that you had some savings this year that you were not counting on so that you could put off that. Um, and, you know, as we all know, you're not likely to have it next year. So th this coming year is going to be the tough one. Um, so then the other is um, you talked about spending down money that you had in the school choice reserve fund. You, you put in, um, you budgeted 217,000 for contingencies in the budget we're looking at. I'm just wondering what the total amount of reserve funds, it's a similar question to what I asked about the regional school budget. So how much do you have sitting out, whether you call them E and D, funds or special needs funds or um, that, that uh, um, potential safety net for you? Yeah, so we don't, it, unlike the region, we don't have E&D. So excess and deficiency is only, the only school districts that have E&D are regions. 
okay. we're a part of the municipal, so much like the library or the fire, or the police, we don't maintain an E&D fund. Um, same OPEB, you know, operates through the town as opposed to the region, which is a, a sort of like its own non-for-profit or corporation. Uh, I'm looking at Sean because I just want to make sure. I rely on him. Doug enough <laughs> to do it, but Sean answered this question many years in my times with Sean, and he just happens to be on my screen. He can't get away from me. So um, I think to the larger question of reserves, you know, the choice fund has been built up over years. Again, we wanted to build it up for a rainy day, and it's certainly raining, and it may be raining for a while more, as you note. Uh, we have built up a special ed stabilization fund over the last few years. I believe at the end of this year, we'll have $150,000 in that, but Dr. Slaughter can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, there's very specific uses. That was um, the creation of that fund was allowable based on changes in the mass municipal mass Massachusetts modernization municipal. Uh, I'm going to get the act wrong. Uh, act of a few years ago, and that could only be used for unanticipated special education costs. Right? It's not like a true reserve fund that can be used right. just because you're low. Um, but those are really the funds, the contingency we build in every year, and that generally covers a teacher and two paraeducators. And that is focused on we do get every year students who we're not expecting. And sometimes those students have, uh, they tip a class size and needing another section. Sometimes it's about special education needs. And, and we found that to be a reasonable estimate over the past few years. And so um, I also do want to note that we did receive the UMass funds for this year that we're going to use for next year. That, that's a confirmed uh, number to your prior question, um, or for confirmed uh, receipt to your prior question. Um, sorry to skip around a little bit. Uh, that's that's okay. No, that was very helpful. Um, so the the contingency. So what we're seeing plus the uh, the reserve fund. You, you're not sitting on another million dollars there that you're going to be able to draw on. Um, and then the last. Um, so I can turn it over to other people with questions. The um, you took out only one small line, but you had a three thousand dollar line for planning for the sixth grade moving. Um, so uh, do you have the funds if you need to? somewhere in the next 12 months actually make that decision and plan for it, whether or not they move, um, because you have to plan for the building. Um, you know, so it's linked to how many kids have to be where. Um, is that process still going to be on whatever timeline you had thought it was going to be on? Yeah, um, yes and no. So, I mean, I think on the finances, we do have Title II funds could cover. That was covering for additional staff time, uh, not administrative, but professional staff time. Uh, we do have other ways we can try to accommodate that. To the timeline question, we were planning on doing a number of forums this spring on that topic. That clearly didn't happen. Um, so I do I think we can reasonably hit a, a timeline that we need for the building project? Yes, but are we on the same timeline we were thinking in the winter? Uh, quite honestly, no. Um, it didn't. It, we, we still haven't quite found the, found the sweet spot where people would pay attention to a sixth grade question and not, are, are my kids going back to school? And if so, on what days? Uh, so we, we plan to re-engage that in the fall when there's maybe a little more, um, some other variables are more known uh, and we can, we can capture public attention. The challenge right now, as I mentioned earlier, is people are feeling like they're getting a lot of surveys on other topics and we want to do it at a time where people are accessible uh, and able to talk about this. We also don't know what this is going to do for our enrollments. I mean, I, in the next month, um, the district has to perform an enrollment or pro provide enrollment information for the MSBA process for the state. Um, and I don't mean about whether kids are going to return to school in the fall or whether some kids will stay home. What we fully anticipate is the, you know, migration, immigration between other towns and other places. Those, those patterns are going to shift because of COVID. Uh, it's not about, again, schools being safe or families wanting to do distance learning. It's that we've already had families who have said, I'm doubling up or I'm taking another family member and vice versa. They're moving. Uh, because either employment's gone away or they need to be with other family members. So it's a very difficult time to plan for enrollments. We'll have a better sense of that in the fall, you know, whether it's in-person or virtual enrollments. But what we are noticing is uh, our folks who are involved in registration are seeing a lot of changes. And uh, I think it's going to behoove us to wait till that clears out as much as it'll clear out by fall to us uh, to be able to give accurate or more accurate information to the community of exactly what this will look like uh, what our projections of enrollment will be, because that has huge implications of how this experience and where they fit in the building. Thank you, because my last question was, is how certain are you about it, enrollment? And you just answered it without being asked. Thank you. Thank um, you. I'm going to turn it over. I see other hands, so. Yeah, uh, Dorothy Pam, are you? Dorothy? Okay, um, I have a couple of questions, but a quick follow-up. 
enrollment is changing and shifting. Is it shifting up or down at this moment? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so it's a little hard to know what the yield will be. Um, we are getting, you know, seemingly an even number of families who say either I'm moving or I might move as I'm coming or I'm coming or a family member is coming and living with me. So it's really hard to predict. And I, I actually think that uncertainty will extend beyond the fall, but at least we'll get a better, once school actually starts and people have mm -hmm. to be, even if it's on a screen like this, or if it's in person, we'll have a better sense of where that is. But right now the trends vary by the week. Right, so I have the first of my two questions. Um, when you talked about more staff, um, my husband was going on yet yeah, last night about um, what you need is more staff and what would you be using college students? Um, and I think I read about this somewhere in some article. Um, and so that's question one, will you, how are you gonna reach out to get some more of that staff to work with the kids? And the other one is, uh, I know you have to wait on the state for money and information about the buses, but truthfully, why would you, the article about desk spacing suggested that the state, state saying, oh, it can be three feet if you like, that you're saying, no, 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 we're not gonna follow that. We're gonna follow other more sensible advice. So you're not gonna be follow what they say on the bus if you don't think it's good. Right. So like, have you made some judgment what you think might be safe on the buses? Yeah. That's, those so, are my questions. Thank you. So in terms of college students, I did have a conversation last week with UMass, um, the School of Education. Um, I think there's a couple complications with that that makes it hard to predict. One is they don't know how many of their students will be on site, uh, mm -hmm. right? I think that you all talked about that last night is my understanding, or at least it was mentioned. Yeah. Um, an additional piece is what's our comfort level with having UMass students in buildings? And that's something, or not UMass, I don't want to state that, that's not fair. What's our, what's our comfort level with having college students come in our buildings uh, when we're likely to have a no visitor policy? Um, mm -hmm. And w I'll be completely transparent, it's something I'm struggling with because on one hand, for all the points you mentioned, having additional folks that we train, uh, even if they're trained to be educators, could be a huge advantage. On the other hand, um, it's, it's adding people into our space. Um, and so we are, uh, and by we, I mean superintendents across the state, yeah. are really uh, trying to think about what looks like that. The state has given us flexibility where they can do their internship and doing some of the virtual, and that might give us some flexibility uh, that way. Um, but we are actively having conversations with institutions of higher education. UMass is just on my mind because it was the end of last week, Friday afternoon that we chatted. Uh, I think in the bus, we are looking for some state guidance, even if we don't agree with it. You know, we're seeing such variation in what states are recommending. Uh, it was probably, in my opinion, the one place CDC was a little vague because they were like, if you're at step two in there or level two in their process, you can have 12 students. If you're at level three, there's there's no, um, there's not an explicit number. It's not mentioned. And so it seems like there has to be something between 12 and 57, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, one would presume. And so we're, we are looking forward to having that information to help guide us. To your point, if we're not comfortable with it, and by we, I mean my school committee myself, we're not going to follow it. But I think it is helpful to have guide because it's one area. There's a one or two others, but it's the most acute area I think CDC didn't truly answer the question for us. Um, and uh, I think they answered the question on spacing. I fully support the school committee opinion, but the bus uh, didn't seem like it had uh, kind of multiple options to consider given the status of your community. And certainly there won't be 57 kids on a bus, no matter what the state tells us. That I can guarantee right now. I don't wanna speak for the school committee, but I wouldn't put 57 kids on a bus. Um, but is there something between 12 and that? You know, probably. Uh, we did a survey of families, about 30, we had about half of, our students represented in the responses. About 35% of families said they would provide their own transportation. A decent additional chunk, over 20% said they likely could. So what we wanna do is get the state information, get our routes, get what our model is, and then really ascertain from families, are they willing to drive their kids? If they have an empty seat, are they willing to carpool or to pick up a student who is in the same class, who's gonna be in the same cohort group? Um, and so we need to play that out a little bit, but we expect the DESE guidance coming in the next two weeks, so it won't be too long. Thank you. Thank you. Let's um, turn it to Pat. Yeah, I'm going to build a little on Dorothy's question about staffing because you talked about the need for increased staffing. And my question was, would that include hiring additional paraprofessionals or educators? I didn't think about uh, interns. Um, so how will you be addressing that? And how is that reflected in the budget? Or is it not reflected in the budget? 
It's not quite reflected in budget because we have to see what our model is, right? Yeah. The, the, the more flexible our model is in terms of in school, how many days in school, especially if it's a lot, and then allowing for distance learning, uh, that's going to require more staffing. So we do have that contingency, which was referenced before. Uh, we received the good news from Sean and Paula on health insurance. So we were aware of some of that. Again, this conference call I have that I have to hop off in a couple minutes for, Hopefully we'll, we'll well, I, I'm not allowed to use it for staffing. That's the only thing I know. It may be able to do some offsets uh, that allow us to flex some funds towards staffing. Um, and to Dr. Slota's point earlier, we may have to come back and say, if the community wants X, this is what it's gonna cost. And if we can't meet it, then we may have to go to Y. But you know, I'm hoping to avoid that dynamic conversation uh, for the school committee and for your all sake. Um, but I think right now, um, we're just trying to build on multiple models. So next week, for instance, at school committee, uh, we'll be presenting space and where students can fit at six feet uh, and where they can't. You know, where can we de-densify in our buildings that are existing? Some of our buildings are much easier to de-densify. They have a lot of space, uh, right? And I think some of you know, some of the enrollments of our schools used to be much, much higher than they are now. Mm -hmm. Other schools, that's not the case. And uh, some schools have interior classrooms. I'm, now I'm getting to the secondary, but I'll speak it just more generally about our schools that we can't use next year. Um, other schools uh, don't. So we're gonna have literally a map for each school. These are spaces we could use. This is what it could look like. Uh, but until we get more clear on the staffing uh, and the model, then, then we'll have the next set of decisions to make, which is uh, the staffing. I mean, there's four areas we're talking about that aren't explicitly teaching and learning. So we're talking about space, we're talking about facilities maintenance, and cleaning, we're talking about transportation, and we're talking about staffing. Mm -hmm. And so those are the four operational kind of buckets that we're doing, and we're trying to take them, tackle them one at a time. Because, you know, even next week on space, if you watch, it'll probably be an hour long conversation, at least on space. We can't do all four at once. So we're trying to be very deliberate and build both the committee staff and the public consciousness of all those variables, and they all interact with each other. Right? It's not like transportation is independent of those ones. It's actually part and parcel. So we're trying to be very deliberate and not rush uh, in our decision making and our process and try to be very public about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If you have time for another question, Mike, I understand the pressure of getting to another meeting. Are, um, you, yeah, I'm good. are you hearing or feeling that you may have some teachers who say, I don't think this is a safe environment for me to come back into, and therefore they're planning to either quit or retire. So um, let me speak more generally about what we're doing. So we did survey staff a week or two ago, I think it was last week actually, uh, about people who have health conditions that would uh, not allow them to return. Um, and we have legal guidance of how to manage that situation, uh, which is not atypical from someone with a disability that you have to make reasonable accommodations for. Mm -hmm. And so actually this week, our human resources staff is reaching out to all of those individuals. Um, so that's one sort of uh, category of, of staff that we need to be conscious of. Uh, we did offer early retirement to staff members this spring because we knew that some people might have that opinion and we, um, we flexed a little bit of our finances to be able to do that because it actually makes FY, it made FY21 a little bit better for us that some people did accept those Earlier retirement incentives. Um, I think you know the other ones uh, a more complex conversation that we're certainly aware of, um, and we're trying to both accommodate students uh, and and staff and families. And that is a um, the synergy of those is hopefully where we land. But that's probably a more rosy picture than anyone's actually anticipating in any school in America uh, heading into fall 2021. Uh, what I think we can say confidently, what I can say confidently is. We're gonna follow the best medical advice there is in terms of CDC guidance. We're not gonna go short shrift on you know, that, right? When we talk about increasing operational costs, some of that, as I mentioned before, is about making sure our ventilation is as best we can. If room doesn't have a window, kids aren't gonna be in it and staff aren't gonna be in it, right? I mean, we're just been really clear. It might be an office for someone just to put their stuff, but not multiple adults. Um, so that's forcing other decisions, but we're not gonna shortchange the health and safety of anyone in our organization, students or staff, to, to make kids or staff be in buildings more. We're trying to follow the strictest guidance we have from the medical community uh, and from disease experts and seeing what's possible. And that's really where we are. And, and so I think um, some people 
will or won't feel like, you know, things are safe. We surveyed families. We had actually a remarkably high response rate. We presented this last week at school committee. Uh, we had about 88%, 87, 88% either likely or definitely planning to send their kids to school next year. Statewide, the numbers are much lower. And um, my many reasons for that, maybe the lower rates that we had in, in our, our communities could be that we've been really clear all along that we're going to be safety is the number one piece and we're putting that front and front and center. Um, but we had a really positive response rate to that. Um, and so we're trying to balance all of those interests and the fact that we know the vast majority of students are uh, much better served in in-person school than they are in distance learning. We can do distance learning better. We'll be talking about that next week at school committee as well. We did emergency distance learning. We didn't do virtual education. That's the nature we're in. Next year, whatever version we're in, we'll, we'll be able to do virtual education. Uh, but, you know, I think we're, I'm very empathetic, I think we, because we talked about the school committee level, that there are subsets of our population that are more reliant on in-person education, students with more intensive special needs, English language learners, especially beginners, yeah. uh, where distance learning is not necessarily a model that promotes their educational attainment. And so we, you may see the school committee, um, you know, um, set some different um, priorities of in-person versus virtual for different either age levels, age spans, um, disability status, and like larger status. That'll be the conversation over the next couple of weeks. Um, so if I can just add one quick thing, if that's all right. Um, just talking about staffing in general, you know, one of the other complicating factors for us in the coming year is, is uh, we're going to do, as has already been the case, but we'll continue to do, is that uh, if anyone is feeling ill, to encourage them to stay home, so more people will stay home. But then when you think about getting a substitute, bringing in outside folks to do that will probably be a difficult yeah. thing to do. And so how we accomplish substitute teaching and staffing of that uh, will be a complication as well and could potentially be, you know, it, it, it will alter our expense, you know, uh, structure as, as well. Um, but as far as just sort of piggybacking on the idea of, you know, sort of complications of staffing and arrangement of staffing, that's another piece that plays in uh, to, to that conversation as well. Thank you. Um, so I have two more questions, and again, Mike, I don't, you, if you have to go, just go. Yeah, probably, I'm probably four minutes away from needing to get off the call. All right, uh, so then let me use the quick, what I think is the quick one, and that is, are you spending some resources to help faculty become better at distance learning so that if we have to do this again, they're better prepared? Yeah, so yes is the short answer, but let me expand on a little bit to say that we had working groups this spring. It's all on our, we have a fall 2020 website. It's a link, right? If you go to our website and click on fall 2020, uh, it's its own tab. And um, so we have guiding principles and one of the two of the groups, one at elementary, one at secondary was focused on distance learning guiding principles. We learned a lot. We'll be talking about this on Tuesday at, at, uh, at our joint school committee meeting. And I think one of the neat things is we interviewed, or we surveyed middle school, high school kids faculty, uh, staff, and then families. And, and there's a lot of common thoughts about what worked well and what didn't. Uh, we're also, a uh, Google Meet, which is our platform, um, is going over significant upgrades. It already has a sound quality has gotten, it was always good, but it's now best in the field. They're adding in things like breakout groups, which Zoom has, um, doesn't have some of the respectfully safety uh, challenges that Zoom uh, has experienced in K-12 education. Um, so we are investing some resources there, but more generally, we're investing time. And one of the things you'll see, I've already referenced it, is, you know, we'd like to build schedules next year that build in regular time for professional development for staff. So even if we are in school, not maintaining um, some, uh, the typical schedule, because we know there's going to be ongoing training and work that happens. And it can't just be done, oh, we'll get an extra day before the school year and do it. Uh, one of the things we learned this year is that need for ongoing routine collaboration. And that's, if they're looking for silver linings, one of the silver linings is we've recognized that virtual learning is dependent on collaboration in ways that, that teachers, and this isn't our teacher, teachers in general, have not been pushed to do historically. Um, and I think everybody's there, which is a good thing. And it's then how do we implement that and develop plans uh, to do it? So sorry, I didn't, get, I didn't want to give a binary answer because I think <laughs> given a little more context was, was hopefully helpful. Well, let me just, I'm going to ask one quick question, and I know that you have to go, and I know uh, there are other questions that Dr. Slaughter can answer then. Um, special education students, I've heard some concern that this year was particularly challenging to meet the needs of a lot of our students, and uh, are there um, 
staffing decisions that have to be made to address that need if it exists and what are the financial implications of it? Yeah, so um, one thing I can just say very quickly is that this summer, typically the students who qualify for special ed programming over the summer are only students who show significant regression over summer months, students with special needs who show that, which is a pretty relatively small subset of the general population of special needs students. This summer we offered special ed service, granted they're, they're primarily virtual, to every student with special needs. And so we recognize that it was a hard experience. We recognize that we've gotten better at it and we wanted to support them before the fall. Um, so that's my quick first answer. I think the second one is that we've had a mixed, it's been a mixed bag. Some students with special needs have actually done quite well on virtual learning, uh, it sort of depended what the special need was. Other students, it was a great struggle as you noted. Some of it depended on um, siblings and the ability to support and, and a whole large number of variables. So, you know, one of the things I liked, because we talked about things I didn't like uh, about the DESE guidance was really a focus on prioritizing students with special needs for getting more in-person support, uh, in-person schooling next year, whatever that looks like. And there's a firm commitment to that. Uh, the staffing implications, we're still working out. Dr. Brady, our student service director, emailed me right before this call saying, we need to chat about how do we, how do we be flexible. And I think what I'm hoping I find out of this conference call, in addition to the financial piece about uh, space and facilities is the flexibility around licensure and roles. Uh, they've sort of indicated that we need to be flexible and we need some support from the state um, so that we can put our staff in the right places to support the diverse needs of students. Because um, some are going to be in person, some may choose to be at home and we need to support them all and, and there may be some implications on staffing for that. Well, thank you. Uh, so I know you have to go to your I meeting. Um, I, I don't know if Doug can stay for just a couple minutes because Mary Lou and Lynn may have some questions that uh, Doug can at least either respond to or note uh, for you for later. But thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. your being here. Thank, and, you, uh, yeah. thank you for your flexibility. Get me in early. I appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day. Thank Bye. you. Bye, Mike. Uh, so, uh, Mary Lou, did you have something that you can uh, either ask uh, Doug or uh, through Doug? Um, right. I have for Doug. Um, it's out of the classroom, but it, it's significant, I think. The food services, the school system took over last year, and, and hopefully it's very successful. Um, the question I ask is that it, you're asking for $25,000 for Oh, that's in the expense account for food services next year? Or is, is that what you, you spent over the budget? But so it would seem to me it's probably going to be, we don't know what the number will be because of the COVID and where you can serve food and how it's covered and if it has to be done in the classroom. Do you have any kind of information along that line that you could tell us? So I can say this, uh, yeah. The, the short answer is food service will be decidedly different next year than this year. Uh, it, uh, but I will say that it, it looks as though there's going to be some, some ongoing extension of some supports. Uh, I literally saw this yesterday. I haven't followed up on the details of it. But there's currently some supports and some programs that we're running through this spring uh, that we're going to continue, you know, be able to continue to, to leverage. And that will give us um, uh, some access to some funding. So currently what we're doing is we're delivering meals out into the, into the community. And every meal we serve is reimbursed uh, as if it were a, uh, a free lunch at school. Um, and so it's a pretty significant amount of support in that way. That, that kind of support and that flexibility is, is going to continue through the, the coming school year. Um, but operationally, I think we're still, you know, some of it will be dependent upon what happens in any given building relative to where the kids sit and how they'll move in the building as to how we'll bring food to them and uh, deliver food to them. So I think it's a real open question. Uh, you know, there's some aspects of that that might be less expensive. There's some that might be more expensive. What are, you know, what and how are our labor costs going to going to change relative to that? Um, so it, it, it's a lot of uh, planning that's still to be done at this point. We've not modified our budget really yet because it's just too early. Hopefully it will be not wildly different, but uh, there is some some hopeful uh, support from the from the federal level around some of their food service programs that, that I think is going to help us out a little bit in that regard. Good. And one last simple question. Uh, why is the uh, stipend for school committee members being shifted to the town? Um, 
Mr. Mangano may want to answer that question. Uh, you know, I think that the, it, 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 uh, it sort of separates the schools from uh, paying the people that direct the schools, I think, is, is it's a sort of cleaner um, uh, chain of command, as it were, relative to the, to the, to the payment. Uh, so separating the payment uh, and where that's coming from, from the authority. Uh, so the school committee has authority over the schools, and yet then we're turning around and paying them. So it's it just sort of separates that out. Um, I don't know if if, if Mr. Mangano wants Mr. Mangano wants to add something else. Or Paul me. has a, Paul has a uh, response also. Paul. Yeah. So um, the the um, salaries that the school committee gets paid is controlled by the town council. It's only by vote of the town council. So since they don't control what that number is. I felt we felt it was important for that to be on the town side of the ledger. It's not that much money, but the school committee doesn't can't control whether that number goes up or down. It's only the town council that can control that. Okay, thank you both for your answers. Okay. Lynn, did you have anything? Yeah, I actually um, one two follow on questions. One's one's follow on. One's kind of a broad um, thought about how we think about this. Um, the question is whether or not how much are we spending and, and are we spending some time helping parents understand how to structure the learning environment at home. And I ask this because I had the pleasure of um, attending in virtually uh, a class of Kathleen Perkins from third grade in um, down in, in Cracker Farm and she has amazing good attendance of students still coming to her class. But, you know, I, I mean, the varied levels of where students were sitting, what they were doing while they were also in class was interesting and challenging to her as a teacher and uh, to her assistants as well. And I just have to say, I truly admire any teacher and all teachers that have been teaching in this kind of an environment. But I do wonder whether or not the school is doing things to help parents uh, think about how to structure that learning environment when students have to be home. Um, I, I'll say this about that. I, I believe, you know, and, and, and Superintendent Morris mentioned this a little bit earlier in talking about the difference between sort of emergency distance learning and, and virtual education. I think that shifting to a different model, being a, a bit able to prepare for the coming year will alter the way in which we think about and deliver um, those, those services. And so I think there'll be, uh, at a minimum, you know, some of it's going to be dependent upon the child themselves. And so he spoke to that, you know, relative to some of the kids with special needs and, and that sort of thing. I think, you know, age is a huge factor. Some kids that are, old, you know, kids that are older are much more able to do it. Um, I think also, you know, we learned a tremendous amount about uh, things that work and don't work in that kind of environment. And so it is a, it is a pretty significant piece. And so I think that's, that's part of that professional development piece. And, and part of that is, as far as professional development, how do then teachers engage both students and and their families and and getting a greater understanding? I think they got a lot of understanding of this, but a greater understanding of of uh, people's you know uh, home situations and sort of how to accommodate that well and to uh, support them in what ways they need to, but also um, you know uh, how do you structure or, or you know frame uh, your expectations. Uh, for those environments uh, that are that are functional for everyone, and so I think that that's all part and parcel of the the process that uh, we'll be going through and, and learning from what we learned this spring and, and what we did this spring and what it was like, and then also trying to prepare for the coming year. Um, we try to leverage that. I, you know, there's some real opportunity in some ways with virtual education, and Dr. Moore spoke to this um, relative to to uh, the the nature of the collaboration people had to be and the presence they had to have to have these conversations. Mm -hmm try to be functional at any level but i think that that poise you know we're now poised to to leverage that uh to to do it better and and try to uh, continue to refine our process that way so i do have one other thing and that is this going back to how you've talked about this year and the upcoming really uncertainty i mean it's amazing that you can even put out a proposed budget but I also expect, and you've, you've all implied, that you probably will be back for additional conversations at some point. And um, I think we have to be prepared for that. And I'm hoping that in the uh, presentation of those, of those, you know, of it, here is a situation, 
it's now different than when we first talked with you. You can provide us with the trade-offs of what it will mean if you do this versus this, because you know there, there is not a bottomless pit, and um, we all value education uh, and want to make sure that we maintain whatever we can. But at some point, there may have to be some trade-offs, and uh, when we look at future. Um, conversations that we may have this year, hopefully not next, um, but we might. Um, we, it would be useful to understand what we're trading off by doing model A or model B. No, I absolutely think that's going to be a critical part of the conversation because I think, you know, we're, we're uh, operating in a, in a very nebulous time because we don't have a sense of what the state is going to uh, provide and, and sort of what level of support they're able to provide. Um, and certainly at the federal level, they've given no indication either as far as any um, additional supports. You know, we haven't gotten any concrete news relative to an additional level of support that might come from the federal level either. And so those will both, you know, uh, lend themselves, if those become clear, when they become clear, because they'll ultimately become clear, we'll, we'll sort of set the frame of what resources are available, and then we, we'll start to evaluate and, and you know, uh, reassess priorities and, and talk about those kind of trade-offs and, and what we uh, can do within the resources available. And, and there's going to be some hard decisions to be made. And, and because on the on municipal side, setting on, you know, speak, as Mr. Steinberg mentioned, my previous experience in the finance committee, I certainly appreciate, you know, the needs and the, the necessity of things the municipal government does. Uh, you know, police department, fire department, DPW, uh, all of those need to be able to do their jobs and they're operating in a different environment as well. And so those have additional demands in some respects and constraints uh, separate from financial, just physical by virtue of the public health crisis. So um, we'll certainly be keeping that in mind and thinking of that and, and understanding that, that there are and will be, I think in the next year or two, um, significant, fi significant financial limitations and uh, we're going to have to find, you know, we'll definitely have to operate from our most important priorities first and foremost, our requirements, um, you know, by law. I mean, some of the, some of the requirements we have uh, that drive some of our budget are, are driven by uh, requirements of law. And so we'll, we'll be, you know, meeting those, those as, as is needed as well. Thank you so much for everything. So um, we really do want to get on to the uh, share and Sherry. Uh, Dorothy's had her hand up, so did you have one last quick question? Unmute, please. Yeah, yes, okay. I, I want to stress the importance of being in person by whatever means. Um, I taught emergency online courses to college students, and most of them were in their beds with their sheets pulled up to their chins. It was um, obviously they were very uh, traumatized by the whole thing. And I was not able to supervise in person my own grandchildren who spent the day alone, except for parents coming home at lunch, managing themselves. And I saw my uh, grandson, who's very bright, start to fall behind. So I understand about special needs kids, but I will tell you, the very bright can fall off too. So I, I, I think it, there's one thing you haven't talked about, and that is using other buildings in addition to the school buildings that are local to where groups of children live, where the children could walk. I'm talking about really old fashioned time, but we could do it. There are buildings in town. So there'd be more smaller cells that would in some ways be safer. They'd be connected to housing areas and the children could, could walk or even a teacher could come and walk them in like a train, you know, to the classroom. Because I think it's so important that they be in a classroom having socialization at distance and being with a real teacher. Because I saw a lot of fall off. There's no doubt. I mean, superintendent has spoken to this at, at certainly at school committee meetings. The 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 nature of the distance learning is is not uh, well serving a lot of the kids, even regardless of whether they have a special need or not. It, right, right. it has not done well for some kids, and and has not been uh, able to do well for them. And and I think you know his personal opinion would be to to uh, to the extent possible, we'll get all the kids physically into the buildings as much as as we can, and and absolutely to that point. I think on the question of other uh, locations, uh, you know, some of the concern that you run into with that, it's not that we don't have some spaces that uh, are around town. I mean, there are some, you know, uh, the, 
the Southeast Street School is, is one that's near Crocker Farm. Uh, the East Street School is, is uh, a location across the street from Fort River School. Um, you know, the, the difficulties in, in other physical locations that the superintendent has mentioned is you often, uh, from a public health standpoint, just a general health standpoint, you know, need a nurse or someone of a, of a health care provider standpoint that can be either in that location or close mm -hmm. by, and, and that's one piece. And then also, uh, there's an administrative person that needs to be there. And so you start to end up with the staffing issue where you start to add these overheads to, the, to those locations that become prohibitive in some way. But, but by that same token, depending on how things play out, those, you know, those metrics change, those, those, the economics of those things change. And so, um, you know, I think that, that, as he said, the, you know, the idea of being nimble is going to be critical because I think circumstances will change that may drive us to, uh, you know, some things that don't seem reasonable or, uh, or I, uh, you know, appropriate at this point, but maybe mm -hmm. five months from now. Um, so I think we're, we're definitely going to keep that in mind. I do think the superintendent's definitely of the opinion, especially as the younger you go, that, um, you know, in-person education is much more effective. Um, there's just some things you can't do. It's, it's, it's difficult. Uh, you know, the virtual has its, has its place and it has its, uh, its options. And I think there are ways we could, you know, implement it better. But I think, uh, you know, the in-person education is, is a far better tool. Uh, there's a ton of things kids learn at school that aren't, you know, that are about being in social settings. That's it. Um, that aren't specifically tested on MCAS or something like that, that are also important things to learn and navigate and you know, are part and parcel of that. So we wanna have those experiences for kids as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, Doug, thanks for being with us. Uh, again, uh, thank Dr. Morris on our behalf. We really appreciated the time that both of you have spent with us in explaining um, a very important piece of our budget. Um, I, Hope that Sharon is still with us. I see her, the picture of uh, what appears to be her office and uh, she is. Uh, so Sharon, thank you very much and I appreciate your patience. And uh, so I uh, want to uh, turn the subject now to the, to the library budget. And as we did just a few minutes ago, uh, Dr. Morris uh, started out with a brief overview presentation and uh, some, some initial thoughts and then turned it back to questions. So I wanted to um, welcome you and ask you uh, if you have anything that you'd like to introduce. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I was wondering if I could, would you allow me to share my screen just so I can go over pieces of the budget packet? Um, I believe that that is possible, uh, so go ahead. And, uh, okay, can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay, um, what I wanted to do, I hope you've had a chance to, to look at the budget packet. I'm not gonna go through line by line and page by page. I would like to skip right on down to the appendix before ending up on the summary page. So I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna make it bigger so people can see it. Um, so one of the questions that I get very often from town councilors as well as residents is how exactly is the library's budget uh, crafted and, and how do all the pieces fit together? So I wanted, I, I created pages eight and nine of the appendix so that you all can see exactly how much money was spent uh, from exactly which bucket of money on exactly which uh, spending category. Um, and so we, we've always used the summary format on, on page five for voting purposes because it's clear and concise. But in order to fit all that information onto one page, a lot of the numbers have to be consolidated. So, um, you know, when things are consolidated, it, it tends to open up questions. And so I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to walk you through what's here. Um, so this is FY19, the actuals. And at the top of the page, that's all our different buckets of money that we have. Along the left-hand side is all the different expense categories that we, that we use. And in the middle, in bright orange, the bold letters, these are the categories that we use in the summary document. So, so you can um, see how they um, match up. 
And then over here on the right hand side of the screen highlighted in peach, these numbers are the totals that you'll see that correspond uh, on the summary page. So starting with the buckets, 75% um, of the library's total operating budget comes from the municipal appropriation. And you can see here that the appropriation is used for staff salaries, benefits, and the rent that we pay for the Munson Memorial Library. Uh, the town appropriation doesn't fund, doesn't fund books. Uh, it doesn't fund the majority of our operations. It doesn't fund our CWMRs account or, or maintenance or utilities or programming. So next uh, over is the endowment and the state aid bucket. So our endowment, that's, I think that's really where the biggest question comes in because when, when you see that the endowment is worth $8 million, it, that's just such an enormous amount of money. And so how can the library ever say it doesn't have enough money? Um, so the endowment does, uh, t it was 14% it was of our, our, our budget in FY19. And the state aid, the amount that we spend in state aid was 3% of our budget. So this is where you're going to see where the town's appropriation kind of falls short. It doesn't cover all of our staff salaries. So in FY19, almost $88,000 was spent in state aid and $7,000 from the endowment on personnel. And, and this is normal. This is the way it, it's been for a very long time. It's not due to an increase in, in staff. If anything, our staffing levels are decreasing over time. So also under the endowment, you're going to see that a portion of it is used for buying materials. But for the most part, the endowment is used for all of our unsexy expenses, I call them. So it's maintenance for the Jones and the North Amherst Library. It's the utilities for the Jones and the North Amherst Library. It's insurance for the Jones and North Amherst Library. Our annual audit, we, um, we have to conduct our own audit separate from the town, so we have to pay almost $12,000 for that. Software licenses, supplies, and, and our CWMARS assessment. So those are all the things that come, that are paid for uh, through the endowment. Next, I wanna talk about our fundraising bucket. So down below what I've done is I've highlighted in yellow. So these are, are the buckets of money that, that we get through uh, the kindness of strangers. Uh, and so what we've got are the restricted gifts, uh, our SAMIs, uh, grants, any grants that we apply for, uh, monies that the friends raise, and the Woodbury account, which is also overseen by the friends. Uh, donations to special collections, and then monies left over from the building expansion and renovation uh, project back in 1993. Those were donated monies as well. We don't have a lot of money left over there. Um, so all the fundraising money goes towards, you'll, you'll see materials, the majority of it, um, and then down below it goes towards programming and, and special collections here. Um, the, there are some donations that have gone towards our grounds and, and those, those donations uh, were given, they're restricted to our gardens, upkeep of the garden. So that's where those expenses are. And so that leaves our uh, fees and loss books category here and our sale of goods category here. Uh, that's, that equals less than 1%. Those two columns equal less than 1% of our operating budget. And that money is used for uh, materials and a, a little bit of operations. So that was FY19. Now I'm just gonna briefly go over page nine, which is FY21. Uh, so I'm gonna bring it down to the bottom here, just showing the percentages of the total operating budget. So you're going to see the municipal appropriation column, uh, which is 77 of our 77 percent of our FY21 budget, and it is being level funded from the FY20 budget. The endowment draw is going to make up 13.3 percent of our budget. The trustees have approved a 4.5 percent draw rate, which is uh, 0.1 percent less than FY20, the one that we're in now. State aid is 3.3 percent. 
All of our fundraising lines equal 5.6% of our total operating budget. And then um, the fees and loss books equal less than half, uh, less than one half of a percent, um, basically because of COVID. So, so that's kind of how all the puzzle pieces fit together. Now I want to bring you back up to the summary page, which is, um, you know, the traditional document that we've used over time for, um, voting purposes. So before COVID happened, Mike talked a little bit about this as well, uh, this column in green, um, the, the trustees were ready to approve this budget request. Um, those were the good old days. And so instead, this red column, this is what we are presenting you with today. It is a 0.6% decrease from FY20. And so um, quickly under expenses, it's a 1% decrease in salaries, 3% decrease to benefits, 2% decrease to materials. Um, what else have we got? We've got a 13% increase to repairs, and that's just because our building and systems are old. Um, utilities, there's an 18% increase to utilities. Again, our systems are just old. We've been able to increase uh, programming by 100%, uh, and that's, again, due to fundraising, and uh, a 50% increase in special collections. And under revenue sources down below, this is showing the uh, level funding, the 0% increase of the town appropriation, a 0.9% increase to the endowment draw, even though the, the rate is decreasing, from 4.6% to 4.5 in FY21. Uh, we took the state aid uh, figure off of the, the cherry sheet. And so we're looking at a 4% cotton state aid. And, and of course that may go down. Uh, a 16% decrease to gifts and Sammies and grants. And again, that's due, that's due to COVID. Um, you know, when the buildings are closed and people can't get into them to enjoy services, it's really hard to ask for people to donate money. Um, we are looking at a 9% increase in friends gifts, gifts. And as I say that, so our friends are still soliciting donations and we still appreciate those donations. Uh, a 28% decrease in fees and lost books. And again, that's because of COVID. Um, because the buildings are closed, we can't, people aren't using our meeting rooms. So the rental fees no! have gone down and, um, and things like that. People aren't paying for photocopies and, and prints, uh, print jobs from the computers. Uh, level funded BE and R and a 58% decrease in sale of merchandise. Again, because we're not in the building, it's hard to sell t-shirts when we're not there. And so that's really, that's the bulk of it. Uh, my, the last thing that I wanted to say is, well, so how, why am I not a nervous wreck? Um, and it's entirely because of staffing and timing is everything. And we have just lucked out. So our receptionist retired in the fall of 2019, and we have not filled the position. Uh, there is money in the FY21 budget for that position. It's a full-time, uh, fully benefited position. But if there are mid-year cuts, then I just will not fill that position. Our North Amherst Library branch head, she retired in March, and we can't afford to hire a new one uh, for, for FY21. Um, and then there's another person in another full-time uh, position that will be retiring at the end of August, and uh, we cannot afford to fill that position. Um, and, and this budget maintains two unfilled positions from a couple of years ago. And really the only way, the only reason we're able to continue to maintain services with this many fewer full-time positions is because of our reduced staffing levels right now, um, because we're not in the building. We're providing uh, fewer, we're providing our services, but in fewer hours. And what I mean is, so we're working six days a week instead of seven days a week, and we're not working um, Tuesday and Thursday nights. So, um, that's how, that's how we're able to hold it all together for now. Um, but we'll be reevaluating, you know, on a month by month basis at this point, who knows what's going to happen. So that's, that's everything in a nutshell that I wanted to chat with you guys about. 
Well, thank you for the overview. Um, Lynn, I see you have uh, your hand up to a question. Yeah, um, I was interested to see your rate of draw on your endowment over the last couple of years and wondered if you've been able to maintain the principle with that and was that largely a, able to be done because the market actually was generous and you had done well on investments? Yes to all of that. And if Bob were here, he would be able to answer more articulately. So I did, I, I was expecting this question. And so as of May 31st, the endowment's value was $7,959,331. Um, that is down. So the highest point this fiscal year, we were at 8.3 million, but the lowest point in this fiscal year was 7.1 million. So we're doing very well. And um, so the draw rate, we were able to lessen it. Um, well, so I, I applied for a, a Massachusetts CARES grant and um, that was for $10,000. I will be able to use that for Canopy. That was the big reason why last year, or FY20, we, the trustees approved going from 4.5 to 4.6% was for Canopy. And um, with this grant, uh, I'll, I'll be able to fund Canopy through that way instead of increasing the endowment draw. I also was very curious. Um, but in this year's match for that, you're using state money. So could you explain that? Wait, uh, so you were cut off for a little in the beginning of your question? What yeah, did you I, I just got a notice that my internet was unstable. So in your report under, on page four on the expense side, okay, I need to open my screen more. Um, you have um, revenue sources and then you have the FY20 amount to spend on materials and the FY20 amount to spend, the FY21 amount. And this is to deal with also your state aid where you must have a certain amount of money to be able to get the state aid? Correct, so there are several state aid regulations uh, that, that public libraries have to abide by in order to be eligible to receive state aid and, and to be certified. And so one of them is the municipal appropriation requirement, mm -hmm. which means the town needs to appropriate two and a half percent uh, more than the average of the past three years appropriations. So that's, that's one piece of the puzzle. Another piece of the puzzle is our materials expenditure requirement. And that formula is 13% of the town's appropriation in any given fiscal year, less the benefits costs. You have to spend that on materials. So the reason why from FY20 to FY21, the materials expenditure is going down, it's because our benefits line is going up. It's just the way the math works out. So the more we spend on health insurance, the less we have to spend on materials and vice versa. I think the thing that was confusing for me is in dealing with match under grants and contracts, you can't use certain kinds of money to match money and you're using state aid for materials, but you're allowed to do that. So I, I understand it now. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy. Kathy, you're muted still. Didn't hit the button fast enough. Um, just on the pull on the endowment, I'll just start there and then I had other questions, but um, it's the recommended amount was 4% and you've been above that now for multiple years. And so the uh, question and it's the other questions I'm going to have is how sustainable is your budget um, going forward? Um, it, you know, the endowment's not down by a huge amount, but if you're, it's also not up from last year. So if you're pulling 4% out of it and it's not up by 4%, you will start to see it go down. So that was on that piece. Then when I looked at your gifts, um, Sammy's plus friends, not counting this year, but just going from 
um, FY18 to 19, the 19 actual versus what you had expected to get, um, or 20, you weren't getting as much as you had targeted to get in terms of increases. So I don't, I can understand why COVID would hit you hard on the fundraising, but just um, I've, I've wondered whether trying to do two kinds of uh, fundraising campaigns, one for a new building and one to support an operating budget, whether you're going to the same people and they'll write a check for one, but not for another. Do you have any sense of that on fundraising? Because it, 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 when I'm adding the two together, it's, you know, you, you came in with actual n under where you thought you were going to be with budget by quite a bit in last year. And then this year we'll have a difference. So, so those pieces fill the hole left by money not from us. So I'll just give me my last question on this is going to be, um, did you save a lot of money when you shut down? So do you have a buffer off of last year's budget that we can't quite see, you know, off of FY20 that will help you as you look in this year? And what about places like North Amherst Library or the branch libraries? If, are you gonna, if one person's gone, are you replacing that person with a less expensive or will there be fewer hours in the branch library? You know, how are you gonna be balancing this they're both shut right now, so I can see you're balancing it. But are you saving money because people aren't working? Is that last piece, particularly the branch libraries? Okay, that is a lot of questions. Yeah, I can go back it's, over each no, of them. No, it's yeah. perfect. I was writing them down. They're, they're awesome questions. So first, I'm going to go to the fundraising piece. So we lost $20,000 last year because we didn't have a Sammy's 2020. It will be held in, uh, hopefully, in spring of 2021. Um, we lost over $100,000 uh, due to COVID between fundraising and Sammy's and uh, building me uh, meeting room fees and um, you know sale of merchandise and things like that. The friends were expecting, their goal for FY20 was $140,000, but they raised $110,000 and they still have one more mailing to go. So um, they're actually doing really well. If you had told me back in February and March they, that they would be this successful, I would have said no way in heck. Um, so they've been awesome. So will that continue to go beautifully? I think so. Um, uh, wait, so wait, that's the, that's the fundraising piece. Another question was the endowment. So I was really glad that you asked that question. So uh, if you look at page, what page is this? Page three, where the endowment is, uh, the endowment trends and the, and the Woodbury trends. So um, uh, going back a few years, so leading up to uh, the recession of 08, 09, the library, uh, our endowment was passively managed. And, and, then, and then the recession hit. And so the trustees um, decided to switch to active management. And that's when that $1.5 million loss you know, became real. And so from 08, 09 to uh, through FY15, uh, it was actively managed. But then in FY16, we switched back to passive management and, and we've been doing better because of it. We're spending less money uh, on, on the management itself and, um, and we're staying the course. So the reason that I say that it, it had to do with, uh, uh, so I don't have in front of me what our returns have been over the year versus what our draw has been. And are we dipping into the principal? Um, the answer is no, we're not dipping into the principal. So if you go to the summary on page five, you'll actually see. Uh, so historically, the trustees, gosh, long before I ever came around and ever any any of you were ever around, uh, the trustees were taking, you know, between six and seven percent drops. And it's this set of trustees that came in and, and really started to pay better attention and slowly over three years dropped it down to a four percent draw, which is really where they want to be. And so you'll see uh, FY16, FY17, FY18, it was at the four percent. Um, we went up to five in FY19, 
gosh, why did we go up to five? There was a good reason. Um, we had to spend our reserves. Oh, yes, that's exactly what it was. So the way we were able to drop down to 4% was by spending all of our reserves, which made sense. It makes complete sense because it wasn't making any money for us um, sitting in our checking account. Uh, we'd rather let it sit with Vanguard. Um, but because we spent our reserves when FY19 came, we ended up having to take the higher draw. And again, here we are coming right back down. So yes, this is absolutely um, the way to go and, and, um, and will be successful in the long run. So that's the endowment question. Then I wrote down question number three, dollar savings. Oh, that meant um, you were asking if we save money because of COVID, absolutely. Um, not through personnel, our, our personnel have been, say, uh, have been paid and have been working throughout. Um, and now, uh, right now what we're doing, you mentioned the branches, which is great. So the Jones Library is where all the returns are happening because I need a lot of space for that. It's just the sheer magnitude of it and, and the items are being quarantined. So that, all the returns have to happen at the Jones. Um, but, and then the checkout is, is actually started the end of last week. So that's also happening at the Jones. I want to do that at the two branches, but I can't yet. I need at least two staff members to be in the building in order to offer that service because it's very complicated. It's, it's not as simple as just one person standing there bringing out a book to a person. Um, there, there's a lot involved. And so until I can have two people in those small buildings at the same time, I just can't. So in the meantime, the North Amherst Library um, is where our reference services are being provided out of. So that is in use. And then the South Amherst Library, uh, we are working on setting up. That's where homebound delivery will be. Um, managed from. Uh, so the books will be, we will, the Jones will deliver books to the Munson Library and that's where the uh, homebound volunteers will come and pick them up and then deliver it to people. So that's the branches. And then regarding the North Amherst Library Director uh, branch head position. Um, so without a North Amherst Library open to the public, it, it's just fine not having a branch head. Our ultimate goal eventually is for uh, one, one branch librarian to oversee both branches um, and to spend uh, um, you know, doing administrative work and advocacy, that kind of a thing, and to be able to use other staff members uh, for the actual circulation duties, that kind of a thing. You know, I want to pay, I want to pay this much for administrative and planning and policy, and I want to pay this much for uh, circulation duties, if, if that makes sense. So we're, we're working on this overarching uh, picture for uh, providing services at the library, even separate from COVID, because COVID will go away eventually. So I think those are all the answers to all the questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking to see if there are other questions. Uh, I don't see any hands at the moment, and uh, so I guess the one question that I was thinking I would ask everybody, but I never got around to asking it of the superintendent because we were so busy with him. Um, as you're looking ahead for FY22, uh, what are your uh, greatest uh, trepidations and what steps are you taking to um, sort of learn and prepare? Yeah, so right now it's through personnel, you know, over the, over the past 10 years that I've been here, uh, we have slowly been cutting more and more and more. And so we're to the point where I, you know, I, there isn't another box of paper clips I can cut from the budget. So um, after, uh, if I need to save more money than than the receptionist position, then um, then I'll have to dig deeper. And I have not started playing with with real numbers. Certainly, the staff have gotten together e even in in the past few years, talking about well, how would we cut and and um, you know how do we best serve uh, all three communities? You know, the two branches and the Jones community because all three uh, locations are important. So how, you know, how is best to, to deal with that? It, it, the cuts will have to be through staffing, which would affect open hours, that kind of thing. So it's, 
Um, so I don't have an answer yet. I'm kind of hoping and praying that it won't go beyond the receptionist position. <laughs> Well, it can on our con manager to perform some magic for us. And he's, he's ready. Anything else that uh, anyone from the committee has? If not, uh, yes. I, have a question. I just have, um, I, it's one I meant to ask, and I was trying to figure out how to ask it, but um, as with, the, with Jones being closed or with the North Amherst being closed, has it given you an opportunity to go back inside the building when no one's using it? And so custodial staff can do some deep cleaning or you can go into rooms that had boxes and sort through them and say, we don't really need to keep these magazines. They're old, you know, sort of, you know, I, you know I'm just thinking the way I did it in our house is one of the things that I went through every file cabinet in the house and I went through old stuff and it gave me a chance uh, to clean stuff out that I hadn't had this mantle space or time. So has it, have you had that opportunity to sort of say, um, let's think of how the internal parts of our buildings are and can we empty out some offices or empty out some space, partially thinking about when you're reopening? So we've been doing that all along, you know, uh, for the past 10 years through the, the budget process. Um, we don't have any extra magazines laying around. Um, the magazines that we have, are, are uh, the back issues are not available digitally. So that's the only reason we have them. Once they're available online, then we just get rid of the hard copies. So um, so we've already done all that separate from, from COVID, um, but the, uh, certainly our building maintenance throughout these past several months have have been cleaning the building and now that staff have been back um, what a month and a half now at this point um, you know it's being sanitized um, disinfected every day several hours per day for the staff so yeah okay anybody else any additional questions pad you had your hand up for a moment and then i see it down. yeah i was going to ask about digital archiving of materials and stuff that she sort of answered, Sharon sort of answered that. Although I would like to know if there are any employees dedicated to doing that to open space in the library. Yeah, uh, are, are there any, are you asking, are there staff who are digitizing? Yes, doing the digital archiving that would allow you to get rid of magazine copies, et cetera. Well, we, we so we go through, um, we go through vendors for our uh, magazine databases. So, it, it, you know, it's other companies that are, are taking care of digitizing. And, and so, you know, once they're offered, that's when we throw away our collection. But as far as our special collections archive goes, then yes, we do have staff who are in charge of um, digitizing those. And we, we do, we're working on a, a, a CPA grant right now. Um, oh, good. good. And that's in uh, collaboration with the town's IT department and the Historic Society. If, the, uh, if you were able to digitalize the historic materials, what impact could that have on um, the amount of money to, um, you want to use to preserve those materials? So there's a difference between digitizing and, and preserving documents. You need to do both. Yeah, uh, just because you digitize something doesn't mean then you can throw away the original. Um, archivists across the world would just roll over in their graves if we did that. Uh, and the problem with digitizing also is that the formats technology changes at the speed of light. So, you know, right, you have to keep changing them, right? So that it's another reason why you have to keep the original. All right. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Anything else? Seeing, seeing no other hands up. Um, so I want to thank you, Sharon, for uh, having spent the time with us this afternoon. It's been very helpful. I thought your presentation was really good, and I want to thank you for working cooperatively with us and with uh, Paul and the finance staff in town. This, as I said, the um, superintendent has been an extraordinary year, and uh, it's really taken all of us to work together as a team to make it happen. And I've really been impressed by everyone across Amherst about how well we have worked as a team. Um, it has made as a horrible situation 
at least something a little bit better because of the way we work together. So thank you. If you guys have not seen um, uh, Sean uh, as a pickle in a Zoom meeting, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> Bye, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Sean, I won't uh, ask you to explain that. I will just turn it right over to Paul. Uh, and uh, I, I thought that your presentation last night was really good. I had some comments from some other people who were not counselors, but observed and said that uh, they really appreciated the clarity of the presentation that you and Sean made and uh, how it created a really understandable uh, piece for looking at how to look at our budget. Uh, I'm going to start with one question and then turn it over to other members of the committee to see if they have questions. Um, I think that my, you know, as uh, people know, and as you know, it's, um, I always think in long term, in multiple years, and not in single years. <laughs> and I thought the uh, presentation has really been, uh, was great. It was focused on 21. But uh, I was wondering if there's any elements of what you did for 21 that you were doing to help you and help us prepare for 22 and beyond. Yeah, so thank you. And I, I just want to preface our comments by saying that in this meeting, uh, um, you know, I've worked in, I've seen a lot of towns, I've worked in other towns, and to see the uh, extraordinary relationship between the schools, the town and the library is unusual. And I think that goes back for many, many years from establishing the budget coordinating group and the cooperation and the expectation established by the leadership of the town that we will work together. So many other towns are fighting all the time and it's, an, it's the energy goes in the wrong direction, that our energy goes in the right direction. So, um, you know, we were actually just Sonia and uh, Sean and I were talking about that same thing this morning that you just raised um, in terms of where we're headed. And, you know, our plan right now is uh, you saw the assumptions that we have built into the plan in that we expect that there will be some modest recovery in FY21 and with the hope and that we will be going back to somewhat some kind of normalcy in FY22, but understanding that that is there the high likelihood that that might not happen? And what do we do then? What are the recurring sources of revenue that we would continue to uh, um, look at? Um, and we're taking action along some of those lines. So, you know, Sean and Sonia are looking at different, you know, expanding some of our revenue sources. Um, we have tried to maintain some tools at our disposal um, that we can utilize. Um, and um, in addition to the reserves that we're not touching at this moment in time, that those are the reserves that we will touch, or we will, you know, that at this point, that's how the council has lined up that if state aid doesn't come through, it will, it says we will look at reserves. Um, that's just one tool for us. We have also expenditure tools that we'd be looking at as well. Um, so, you know, I think looking forward, um, we're, we're somewhat optimistic and we're, t we're focused on our ability to maintain the services that the town has, has come to build, has built and has come to expect. Um, the next set of decisions will be much harder and involve bigger um, swaths of the, of the budget in our operations. Sean, do you want to have anything on that? Yeah, I'll just add, um, build upon what I said a little bit last night is that we're, we're doing a lot of scenario planning. Um, we've kind of, we built the tool so that we can put in different variables um, to, you know, just model what different realities might look like next year um, and then develop strategies, you know, and it, no matter what happens next year, we can have some strategies ready to go. Um, so we're doing a lot of that modeling um, and yeah, it'll, communication will be important between all of us to um, stay ahead of this. And I, I just want to add that our expectation is that early fall, we don't anticipate what the state does matters a lot. What the federal government says we can do with their 
with the CARES money matters a lot. We don't think we will have real answers to that till the September, October. And I think that's when we're going to be really having this this, this kind of conversation again in a, in a pretty serious way about where are we in FY21 and where are we what's, what's FY22 looking like? And that, that's the way I was thinking about it. And I'm going to turn it over to some other people because in addition to the question of that we were prepared and still are prepared to look at reserves if the state aid does not come through at the amount that we had um, are now assuming. Uh, we also made some very difficult decisions about capital and uh, that uh, the experience in this town was uh, we got to having a joint capital planning committee because we realized we had no way of keeping up with capital and it was having uh, long-term consequences and uh, we don't want to get into that hole yet again. Uh, and so the question is ultimately going to be that um, how, what is it going to have to be our target for capital next year regardless? And um, that it's a discussion that I think we would like to have earlier rather than uh -huh. later so that we can start thinking about it. Uh, not. We really haven't deliberated about this as a committee, but um, it has come up. Um, I'm going to uh, turn to my colleagues on the committee because I think I see three people and I'm just going to go from bottom to top as I, as I look at the list. And Bob Hegner, uh, your hand is up. Do you have something you wanted to ask or say? Yeah, thank you. Um, Paul, I wanted to ask. Um, sort of two questions. The first is the reduction of the capital projects. How does that ripple through the demands on the town employees? In other words, if they're not engaged in monitoring or permitting or things of these capital projects, how much time sort of gets freed up for other things? And, and, and is that a significant amount of time or not, not a significant amount of time? So when, go ahead. Go ahead. so when you mean capital projects, you're talking about not the the major capital projects, but the other the sort of day to day things. Right, like. the day to day, you know, right. Um, and and then the the other part of it is, um, what impact could that have on the potential for overtime or reducing the potential for overtime? So. Um, on most of the projects, overtime is not a, not a factor because they usually are managed by salaried employees. Um, most of the um, time intensive capital projects are either contracted out. Uh, the roads, we always have a, a town employee engineer, a lower level engineer who's mo monitoring the road work and that type of thing. Uh, and that we are continuing to invest in roads and sidewalks. So that's something that is ongoing. Um, so in almost all the other projects, we tend to have a um, sort of owner's project manager, somebody who we contract for specifically for that. We don't have sort of built-in uh, people. There is, um, we do have a facilities manager who's overseeing some improvements that we're doing right now to our buildings. We have a backlog of um, capital funds that Sonia has been sort of um, saying, you know, pushing everybody to clean that up. We want to get rid of all the capital funds of, and not letting people move forward. So this is a year for looking back at uh, capital funds that have been allocated for projects, utilizing that money, and it's actually an opportunity uh, to take care of those things. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, Lynn? Funny, on my screen, I'm not next, but anyway, um, a couple things. Sean, you mentioned a tool, and I'm a, that is a tool for operating budgets that's similar to the capital uh, tool. Lynn, if you're going to ask me to make it public, I don't know if I can do that, all right? I'm not going to make ask you to make it public. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it's, it's more or less an Excel spreadsheet that, you know, we just set up that allows us to plug in different variables. Um, it's essentially the the same thing that's in the in the budget document, um, but you know that goes out five years, and we can plug in different assumptions and see see what it looks like. Right now, I it's a complicated thing. I 
able to build such a thing and uh, being able to plug and play with various assumptions and in, in particularly in this point in time. Um, I do want to go to the larger capital projects for a moment because um, we just asked and are about and ha are now have available to us a look from the library for what it will cost to repair the building. Mm -hmm. um, and in the repair, um, it cut, it hits a certain level and therefore we have to make it accessible, which we should anyway. Um, are we gonna get to that point with some of our other buildings like the DPW and fire? Um, Cause there's a point in time where we keep stretching these out you know, unfortunately, fire is one I know a little too well, and we've now stretched that from 2006 uh, for 14 years. And, you know, we know that there's issues like not having potable water on the first floor and stuff like that. So are we, in fact, going to be forced to have to look at some minimal, if not major repairs? I mean, I know last year at some point, didn't we have to buy a new... Um, air conditioning system for the police station or something and just issues that we keep putting off and is one of the reasons that our buildings in fact now are in such bad shape. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll chime in quickly. I think it's safe to say the longer we go without replacing the buildings, the, the more those costs are going to grow. Um, I know um, we have heard about some potential projects on the radar that if we don't, um, if the buildings aren't replaced, you know, the next three to five years or so um, that we would have to start considering, just like the, the schools and the library had the same thing. Um, so I think you're right to say that the longer we go, the more likely we're gonna see costs and, and larger costs um, pop up for these buildings. I just wonder at some point if we're going to have to get a more firm handle on what some of that looks like as we go forward. Um, I'm done for the moment. Thank you. I think we're building on the same theme here. Um, you know, as I look out, the, the year that has seemed to me, the year after next, the FY22 is the one where huge question marks, particularly on capital, because we just put everything in a column called delayed and really going back and looking at that. But um, one of the assumptions that's always been in every year is that we're increasing our base property tax by two and a half percent. We're allowed to do that. And um, I, I hesitate to even say this out loud, but what if we can't, or what if we can't go up by quite that much? You know, if we, we hit the water rates are going up and sewer rates are going up, if we um, hit the, uh, the year after next or the year after that one where those collide with some of the big investments on either water or sewer. Um, and we haven't recovered locally, you know, in terms of the, the part of the town that doesn't work for the, the libraries and the schools where we're maintaining their salaries, but the local businesses don't come back. So in, in, in thinking of some worst case things, I'm just urging you plug in some of those numbers. Um, the latest with UMass that the UMass students who come out back and live on campus, they can't leave campus. So my husband's first thing is, can they order in? Can they order delivery? So, you know, will the pizza places in town and will Bueno, we, you know, the places where the kids used to frequent them a lot, if they're not allowed to go there, but they're gonna, or will it all be blue wall and on, on campus dining, which means this huge row won't be benefiting. So just trying to think through that. And then on Lynn's point about the delayed with capital, I know we're, we talked about trying to reconvene JCPC as soon as possible in September-ish, because you know if we have to live with another year of 5% rather than 10% or 8% rather than 10%, um, trying to really look hard at every one of those delayed columns and all the out year columns for uh, things that weren't even on the list, that the, the DPW roof is about to collapse on somebody's head. 
um, and DPW roof wasn't on the list, Lynn. You know, last time I looked, you know, s some of these buildings, because we keep thinking we're going to fix the whole building. So, you know, it's, it's two separate ways of thinking. And then meanwhile, we've protected the operating budget. And what I just heard from schools is um, by all sorts of, uh, some of it serendipity, some savings in this year because they had to close down. So they had some money that they didn't use this year that they can use for next year. That's not going to be true for 22. So if we are staffing in different ways and all this, I, I, I'm, I'm going on and on the levels of uncertainty, but I think it's a complicated set of uh, the worst case and alternative and what Lynn asked or one of us, I think Andy asked, if the schools have to come back to us, say, well, we could do this or we could do that and talk about consequences of going down one road versus another. It's a different, it's certainly not a way we've had to be thinking in the last several years. So your budget, Paul, in this nice thick book doesn't have lots of bad news stories going throughout it, you know, so we were able to, because of what you all did early on. Um, so, so just trying to think that way and think of how can we and the finance committee or the council be helpful. I've explained a few times now on water and sewer on the, the a few people paid attention to the five-year increase and said, whoa, <laughs> you know, this year's a big one, but then over five years, and what's that about? Um, but we're going to start to get those people paying attention because it'll be hitting their pocketbooks. So I'll just stop there. And it, it is about this complexity of what and how soon will we know which things. So you said you won't know state and cares until sort of maybe September, you'll have a better handle on it. So maybe that means that in September, there's gonna be some flurry of relook at each of the pieces because we have to come up with typically guidelines in November for the following year. So by October, we have to have a firmer hold on all of this. So, so I just wanna jump, I think what, from my experience coming in from the outside, the strength of the town has been that the select board, the finance committee and the financial officers of the town have always been engaged in a pretty robust dialogue and people trust that this setting, now virtual, is, is that people are reviewing pretty deeply what the options are for the town and that has given the town a, a, a good foundation. And I think that that is your engagement, Kathy, and everybody on this committee is really important to build confidence amongst the townspeople that you're representing their interests, that you're you're as engaged on the budget as the town staff are, that it's not just town staff doing things and that it's this conversation. Um, it's a rigorous conversation that you that we want you to bring to this that's helpful to us as well. Thank you. Oh, excuse me, did Kathy, were you done? Yeah. I am because we're about to over on Thursday, we'll, we'll hit each of the departments because the other kinds of questions I have drill deeper into this large area, this large area, um, and this large area. Um, so we'll have that opportunity um, as we go yeah. beyond the top line. And yeah. just one other thing, Andy, we have we have answers to all the questions that the uh, council raised last night. If you want us to go through the, the questions that were raised by counselors today, we're happy to do that. Okay, um, thank you. Maybe I'll come back to that in just a second. Dorothy, did you have a question? Mm. Uh, I have a comment that follows on Kathy's. And that is, I see an extremely uncertain time that's going to go on quite a while. I have no doubts that Amherst will prevail during this. But I'm thinking that all of the work we did on the four capital projects um, is not, not for naught. Uh, it was kind of call it a thought experiment, thinking about what we could do, what we want to do, what we might do. But I think we need to focus on one thing, which is the schools, because we just don't know. And what's going to be needed, how much is going to be needed, and we can't be a town without our school. So that's my, my thought is let's just do that and see that out. And when we get somewhere, do something else, which means, yes, we'll have to spend money on repairs of buildings, which we're hoping to replace. 
you know, just have to accept that, that that's how we live. We can't let the buildings fall into too much more disarray. We have to be, do our, do our best on it, but just focus on in terms of new buildings or whatever, whatever we're gonna do for the schools. Because I think that's gonna change a little bit in terms of social distancing. Pat? Uh, yeah, a minor thing um, that you probably already thought of, but in terms of the DPW, uh, whether we repair, renovate, or replace, I think included in a document with that information should be information about renting space for the DPW in Hadley. Um, you probably already thought of that, but I wanted to bring it up. Thank you. So, Paul, uh, you said you had some... Um, work that you've done on uh, follow-up to what we talked about last night as a council. Yeah, I think Sonia and um, Sean came up with, went through all every question the counselor asked, and hey, if you want to just go through those, Sean. Yeah, do you, do you think it's better if I just answer them or share my screen? Um, I, I think just talk, say what the question was and then give your answer. Okay. So the first question uh, that was asked was about including a uh, a table in the budget, uh, the budget document itself that outlines the budget additions and reductions. Um, that's something we can definitely do for future budget documents. It's a little late for this budget document, um, but we'll definitely do that. Um, and one thing I just wanted to note is that we are doing a comprehensive review of our budget document itself um, over the course of the next six months. Um, and we'll, we're going to seek input from counselors on things that maybe they would like to see in future budget documents. And obviously this, this table of additions and reductions would be one of them. Um, but we'll be reaching out to you for other ideas of things that maybe you thought would be nice to have in the budget document that we can provide. Um, so that's the first question. The second question is, uh, why was there a difference between the FTE reduction on page nine, uh, Roman numeral nine, of the budget book and the 3.0 FTE reductions that we showed in the, in the PowerPoint. Um, so the PowerPoint showed changes that we're proposing for next year. Um, the staffing table that's on page nine compared uh, what our staffing looks like next year to baseline FY20 staffing or the original FY20 staffing plan. And so the difference is that there were a couple positions that were added during FY20 after that original staffing budget was finalized. There were a couple of positions added mid-year, um, about one and a half FTE um, that were added mid-year. And so that, those one and a half positions are netting out against the 3.0 reductions that we're proposing. Um, so that's why if you look at the staffing trends table, it'll only show a reduction of 1.5. Um, but in terms of actually new uh, reductions for next year, the total is 3.0. Uh, provide detail on marijuana revenues. So um, that again is something that we can certainly include as an appendix or incorporate into future budget documents. Right now there is information on that in the quarterly reports, which can be found on the, the town website and under accounting. If you go to government and departments and then click on finance and then go to accounting. Um, I'll, I'll send these responses out, which will have a link to the report. Um, but in the third quarter report for 2020, which is the most recent one, it, it breaks down what our marijuana revenues look like this year. The fourth question was why are sewer fund revenues decreasing at a faster rate than water fund revenues? And the question also included, aren't those two uh, revenues linked together? And so the, the answer is they are linked together. Um, there was a couple changes that were in the, in the works before COVID even arrived. And one of those was updating our, our model for budgeting. So in the past, we had always assumed that 95% of water consumption would be sewer consumption. Um, and the, the reason for why it's a percentage is because there are several water accounts in town that don't have a sewer uh, associated with it. So it could be a septic, um, or, you know, a, a house or a building that has a septic system, so there's no sewer account attached to it. Um, over time, we've determined that that 95% rate has, is actually not, it's slowly become inaccurate over time. And so this year, the plan was to drop that down to 85%, which was more realistic. So one of the, the factors impacting revenues in the sewer is dropping from 95% to 85% um, in terms of the projected number of water accounts that are also sewer. So that, that affected the sewer consumption and, and as a result, the revenues in sewer. 
And if you if um, if you look if you think if you look at the charts that we showed uh, when we dis discussed enterprise funds at the finance committee, um, you'll see on that front chart for sewer um, there's a percentage, and you'll see that it goes from 95% to 85% for FY21. Uh, there was a question about uh, when we will know what F what the surplus looks like for FY20 and what can be done with those funds. So we really won't have an exact number until. Um, end of July, mid-August, um, when everything is sort of closed out and, we, and we've balanced everything. Um, any surplus that we do have from FY20 will fall to free cash. Um, and so if the council did want to somehow allocate these funds, it would do so by voting um, to use the free cash. And again, there's some, some changes that I have to look into um, that Sonia mentioned related to um, COVID, but typically you can't vote to allocate free cash until it's certified, which is usually in October. Uh, there was a question about can we provide more trend information and again that's something we definitely can do it'll it'll have to be in a future budget document um, but when we reach out to you for input um, that's something that uh, we'd, we'd like to hear about what types of information you'd like more trend uh, trend data on uh, there was a question this one's sort of the most complicated one but it, it was the thing that dr morris referenced earlier and that's why is the elementary school showing an increase when the guidance was for level funding um, so I think the, the easiest way to explain it is to give a little bit of context. Um, when I first started at the schools, uh, charter and choice tuition were in the school budget. At that, a uh, couple of years after I had started back in the early uh, 2011, 2012, um, our, the, the town's auditors asked us to not do that and not have the schools pay directly because technically it was a, something that showed up on the town's cherry sheet. Um, so we took it out of the school budget, and at that point, what we had decided was moving forward, if there was a change in charter and choice tuition from one year to the next, um, that change would be, we would we reflect that change in the elementary school's budget. So if charter costs went up or choice tuition costs went up, the elementary school budget would go down because normally in, 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 his, in the past, the elementary school would have had to pay for that. Um, and on the flip side, if charter and choice costs went down, then the elementary school budget would go up. So it, it's not really a budget increase or decrease from a, like a funding provided standpoint. It's really a cost that used to be in the budget. Um, and so for FY21, which is, it, this has started to actually be a little bit different, um, charter and choice costs actually went down. And so the elementary school was slated to get a little bit above the original 2.5% guidance that was given out. Um, but when we said no to the two and a half percent guidance that we were going to do level funding, we still kept that adjustment in for cho uh, choice and charter. And so that did increase it a little bit above level funding. Um, again, which we don't feel is actually coming in above guidance. We, that's an um, uh, accounting mechanism that's been in place for at least the last five or six years. Um, and so the other adjustment that I'll just note is the schools did ask us if they could come in over their guidance at the elementary level, but under guidance at the region level. Um, and so that the net effect of, of the schools in total would have been a 0% or actually go uh, even less than that. Um, and so that's what they did. They, they came in a little bit higher than guidance at the elementary level, but they came in below guidance at the region level. Um, and so um, setting aside the adjustment for charter and choice, they actually came in um, under guidance. And so again, this is illustrated a little bit better in the document that I have here. So you can kind of see what I mean by the, by adju the adjustments for choice and charter. And then the, the last question I think was about Hickory Ridge and, and free cash that was allocated. Um, so we're still looking into that one to confirm um, where it is in the process, but uh, there is the potential that if you know, the council wanted to that if the, free, if the free cash that was already allocated for Hickory Ridge, if they wanted to uh, change the decision, that could potentially go back. So just as an update, so Hickory Ridge is still in a purchase and sale agreement. Um, there are, the town in, is still doing due diligence on the property. We're not gonna buy a property that we're not comfortable purchasing. I think the funds came out of uh, stabilization funds actually. Mm -hmm. um, so, and if the town does not uh, wanna consummate that, that agreement, those funds would stay in stabilization. This is Sean, as you were describing the whole thing with the uh, change in how much the dollars were treated for charter, 
I sort of had this recollection of might have been you and K. Moran and Sandy Pooler with some uh, monopoly type money doing yeah. a skit in front of town meeting to explain how the dollars were moving around differently. Yeah, I think Sandy and Kay did a skit on the floor of town meeting where they moved around a little bit or something like that to show, to, to illustrate it. And, you know, Sonia and I could certainly do something like that for the council um, if, you would, if you would like that. Is this where you wear the pickle outfit? So Kathy, you had a question. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm the person who uh, asked about Hickory Ridge last night, just, you know, because it was on my mind of remembering the size of the money we took out of stabilization. So part of it was the, um, it's gone on longer than I think we originally thought, and it was contingent on the per sell seller getting into the SMART program at a level that they were comfortable with it. And as I became more familiar looking at the land on how little of it was sale off of all if they just were trying to sell it to be developed because of lowlands, floodlands, rare species. Um, I wasn't sure that they could get a better offer than the town. So it's, it's partly, I don't know how long we allow something to sit before we decide we're just not going to tie the knots on it. Um, and if it if the timing of that came at the point where we got really bad news from the state or other places so we were saying how much are we otherwise pulling down on stabilization so it was just trying to think of where are there where is there money that is similar to what sonia showed us um on we've allocated money but it hasn't been spent yet with capital projects that people can draw on this was one that i said okay that's a big chunk of money so I wasn't I was partly questioning the project but I always had thought of selling off some of those pieces of land to develop to be developed as a way of recouping the town land and but it's also partly do you leave it on the books for two years for three years you know how long do we tie up money so it's I'm, that's more of a comment on that rather than a um, pushing for a sooner rather than later decision but just keeping it on the radar screen so, so it doesn't. So that option of terms of selling off pieces of the land once we t take ownership is still an option available to the town. It doesn't. We're not putting this into conservation or anything like that. It's it's stabilization yep. funds. So it's you will you will own the the land, um, and and the money isn't. It's allocated, but it's not tied up. It's not like it's and we've got enough in reserves that it's if we if we got to the situa situation where we were like that's our last money we're in much worse shape than we ever thought. Um, yeah, so I do want to ask Sean and actually Paul uh, is who I'm asking, would you please make sure that those uh, those answers to those questions are made available to the full council so sure. the people that asked them aren't on the finance committee. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, that was it. Mm. So is there anything else that we want to talk about sort of on the broad overview of the budget, which is what today is about, as has been pointed out, um, specific sections relating to departments that are on the chart for later um, consideration we were not going to address today. We were holding that until next time. So I just want to see if there's anything else people wanted to ask in the broader set of questions. Uh, Dorothy. Uh, you mentioned last night uh, changing, I'm down to do community services, which is very soon. You mentioned that for some reason, uh, uh, that uh, maybe as town staff, you were thinking of changing that date. Uh, I would appreciate knowing if the date's going to be changed, just in terms of me getting ready. Yeah. So um, I, we talked with the chair about that. We are moving community services off of July 2nd and moving it to July 9th, I okay. think. Okay, great. Right. And one of the reasons for that is that we expect public safety to be, to be drawing a lot of questions. Yeah, right. um, but also I want to note that um, the, the police department is having a special meeting with the town council on Monday, July 6th, mm -hmm. where they're going to go in really uh, great detail about their operations. So um, 
So in that, there's a fair amount of time scheduled for their presentation and questions and answers from the council on July 6th. So I think it might be, you know, if we want to focus on the budget on two, on Thursday um, for public safety, we mean fire, police, dispatch. Um, that's where the finance committee, because I think the full council will be engaged on July mm -hmm. 6th. Yeah. And I think the presentation, um, we, Lynn is working to give us a list of um, questions that the council has already identified. We'll try to address those in advance and then answer whatever questions we fail to address. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Lynn. Two things. First of all, we need to do public comment. And second of all, I want to also mention that on the 6th, we will have time for public comment as well. Okay. Yes. No, I'm well aware of uh, the need to do public comment. So I was going to trying to close out this section of the uh, meeting and then uh, go to public comment to see if there's any uh, requests for public comment and then go back uh, to that final agenda item about um, our process and the kinds of questions that um, we're asking, sort of focusing in the direction of what do we envision as the um, expectations of the council for what we present to them and make sure that we are getting the kinds of um, information that we need to provide that. Um, so that that's sort of where we have to go. So if there's, if I'll look just one last chance to see if there are any questions of uh, Paul or um, Sean and Sonia about the overall budget. And if not, um, I'm going to put on the shared screen to get back to the um, item to so we can do see if there's any requests for public comment and then go forward from there. Um, okay, so. Um, I'm going to take now uh, the opportunity to see if there's um, any requests uh, on behalf of, that anybody has for public comment. And uh, so I, I'm going to ask Lynn to let me know if anybody um, asked for recognition. The reason that I put this up here is that you'll see under general public comment, the public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of the Finance Committee are welcome. Residents are um, welcome to express their views for one to three minutes. And uh, that uh, I'll uh, just proceed from there. If uh, uh, and I think that uh, you should be able to any, raise your hand. To I do not see any people having their hand raised at this point. Okay. So, oh, so then, now we have, I'm sorry, nobody, we, do, we do have one. Tony uh, uh Why don't you go ahead and recognize Tony, and uh, if you can bring her into the room, do so. If not, let's uh, make sure she can uh, offer her comments. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. Um, yeah, I just wanted to... Um, mentioned that the Crocker Farm study is finishing up. And I know um, Ben Harrington reached out to uh, Lynn and Allison about scheduling a presentation. But I just wanted it to be on your radar and that there is a cost there and it's part of the overall elementary school solution. And uh, it's something to be considered as you listen to the Jones Library Accessibility Report and the costs on that. And you're thinking overall across the town, how you can afford the major capital projects, that Crocker Farm is a piece of the puzzle and it's not cheap. So I uh, just wanted to, to get that on your radar um, in case we don't get to present our work in the next few weeks and you are moving forward with decision-making on the other projects in the meantime. Thank you. Good, thank you. Appreciate the thank comment. You. It's helpful when you had Go ahead, Lynn. In fact, I have a phone call at five o'clock with the chair of the school committee to see if we can settle on a date for a joint presentation like that. Thank you. Pat, did you have something? 
I was going to ask uh, just if we had anything coming up. So Lynn just answered it. Thank you. Okay. So then what we wanted to do at least to spend a few minutes on our own process. Uh, what we wanted to make sure is that um, we have the information that we envision um, that the council needs. And I had a little bit of discussion with Mary Lou about this because Mary Lou and I um, had the experience of preparing finance committee reports for town meeting. Uh, the council's not town meeting. The council gets the full budget, which members of town meeting didn't get. And most of the members of the council spend some time looking at the entire budget. So I think that uh, what we need to make sure is that uh, we have some vision of what it is that uh, we are envisioning is going into our final report. Uh, and make sure that we either ask the questions when we have department heads for us at future meetings, and if we're identifying information that we missed regarding schools and libraries, that we have the opportunity right now, because they were the first presenters, to go back and just send them an email and ask them the questions. Um, but um, I think we, we also have been trying to be very respectful of our uh, department heads and to adhere to an agreement that we made at a council retreat that um, we uh, try and understand the uh, limitations of the time of our department heads and make sure that we're using a process that the uh, town manager is comfortable with and aware of so that um, as we make any requests that he um, is at least um, aware of our concerns and interests and is able to see that we're getting information in a manner that's most respectful to the people that he supervises. So that, that was kind of in an overview, what I was envisioning that last piece of the conversation to be about. And I didn't know if, uh, anyone at this point has given thought to what you feel um, are the absolutes that are um, need to be covered in a common uh, way through each section of the finance committee report to the council. And uh, yes, Paul. So, so today was a perfect day because you saw um, two ways of you receiving information. You had Sharon Sherry for the library budget, make a presentation, then answer questions. And then you had Mike Morris come in and just answer questions without making a presentation. And I think that's sort of that guidance from the committee, how you would like us, if you would like a pr mini presentation from council, from, from department heads, or if you just say, come in, we've got a list of questions for you. We've already read, read, what, read what you produced. Uh, that kind of guidance would be very helpful to us. You know, the, in, in terms of feedback to you, Paul, um, if we can get the materials in advance, um, whether they, you know, in the school, schools took some doing because they didn't have nice pictures. So we just had to quickly <laughs> look at some columns and decipher them. And when I went to look at the larger elementary school budget that had been presented in March, um, I have a thing about, I told Sean this once, I don't like charts with y-axis that vary all the starting points. So exaggerate differences. So I don't need pictures. So I found going right away into questions extremely useful. Um, as long as I got the material to focus. I also thought going back to last year, um, we had some people who started out with uh, what they anticipated to be the biggest dilemmas going forward, um, you know, on challenges, that, you know, it, it, that were going to affect the town. And I thought that kind of a high level focusing, focusing us of not necessarily look on page such and such and see these numbers um, was, was a useful piece. Um, 
You know, and I know one question I'm going to have that just occurred to me um, as I was thinking about these water and sewer rates is um, we have a plant that's been closed completely because it's been offline. Our operating costs are going to go up when that plant comes back online. So it's things that don't occur to me because I'm not looking at a line. Um, so, but it's if department heads can focus us that way, you know, this is where we are now, but in a couple of years, you're going to see this or that. So that's that's a personal thing, um, if I, because then we have more time that each of us can build off of it. But others may prefer the presentation style. So I'll stop. Mary Lou, I, I would uh, really appreciate if the council uh, decided what format it wanted. I was kind of thrown by school's presentation because when they came to the finance committee in the past, it kind of highlighted what <clears throat> what was in that big document. And it is, it's a wonderful document. There is a lot of information in it. I, w I went online and, you know, it's the format that's been developed over time. So, and then when we wrote up the finance committee report, we took information from there really didn't require that the school department, although Sean proofed everything I wrote to make sure the information was accurate. But otherwise, you, you could take that information and put it in a report. I don't know what this council wants. And before we venture out, I think we need to hear from you what it is you want and the format that you want it in and, and really what's most useful as it comes to a recommendation. No, I think that's a good point that you just raised, and um, it was what I was trying to uh, say a little bit earlier in my comment. Uh, if you watched last night's meeting, what was fairly obvious is that there were a certain number of members of the council who had already received the big budget book and had looked through it and sort of refined questions that they presented, which uh, Sean and Sonia were responding to her, um, already in this meeting, uh, which was real different from the days of um, the, having a town meeting, where the town meeting never looked at the big budget book. And uh, the purpose of the finance committee booklet was to sort of um, reduce that information into a piece that was readable and understandable to town meeting members who uh, were much larger in number and had much less time to uh, process it and didn't, ha didn't have uh, quite the volume of information. So uh, we're kind of in a uh, position where we're still trying to feel our way through and work this through as a group to figure out the right balance. Uh, last year, I felt we really didn't do much of, uh, beyond the broad overview. And I wanted to see if we wanted to do a better job of addressing questions around specific areas of operation, which had not been done before, and how we would want to handle that. Um, I, this is a topic that I asked Athena to put onto the agenda for each of the next meetings so that it's not a single uh, discussion, but uh, was going to be repeated. And uh, the only difference in the, the agendas that she posted for the next three meetings was which departments were going to be there. So uh, that's kind of where we are. Lynn? I'm not looking for another meeting, but I think we have to have one. And that is the following. Um, we get all done with all four of these presentations, but we really don't have a meeting where we come back and review or say how we feel one way or another and whether we think there should be some changes. And my sense is based on the council and having now been part of it for a year and seven months, uh, that the, the council really relies on the committee structure. And I, this is not to reflect on any individual counselor, 
but there are people who frankly are much more comfortable with budgets and a lot of people who are not comfortable with budgets. And so they rely on the finance committee as people spend time being comfortable with the budget. And if, if there's anybody wants to make any kind of suggestions about reduction or things to think about as we move forward into this uncertain year, then what we're having, what we have right now, at least in my mind, is a lack of time to kind of circle back and reflect that way. And so I don't know if that means a long meeting on the last meeting we have or whether it means an additional meeting, but I feel pretty, I, I mean, we're jammed. We did all of this last year over three weeks. Not, and I just don't feel we have that time built in. Let me um, go back to sharing screen for a second if I can get to the, um, what's on your screen is uh, the um, revised So here's where we were with, um, but with uh, community services still in the wrong place. Uh, but you see, we have a fairly tight timeline because so we come back uh, on the 14th. Uh, you know, we we have July after the public hearing. We have one meeting the following day to vote a final re uh, report. Uh, or vote recommendations and uh, try and see if we can review a final report. So we really have to start working on the report fairly early. I don't know um, where we can fit in an additional meeting given the tightness of the time. We really don't have more time than we did last year. Um, it's just a matter of uh, we, we have Essentially, we have what we have. And I guess we do it on the 14th. But it means that when we wrap which, up on the 9th, which we've now thrown another group into that besides general government, uh, we um, basically someone, and unfortunately, Andy, it's usually you, has to go from the 9th to having a draft by the 14th. Which is going to be difficult if we're going to say anything really substantial. I'm going to take this down again since otherwise I can't see people and can't see that the hands are up. Um, the uh, timing is extraordinarily tight and we want to make sure that we have the information that we need from departments and so we can't really wait too long to have it. I think that what we really have been getting at is that we're looking to see <clears throat> what are the um, particular challenges that each department is feeling for this year, how's the, uh, um, what are our, um, what's the thinking as they move forward <coughs> for FY22 what can be done during FY21 to help prepare for FY22. Those are the kinds of things that we would in some ways asking the library and schools. Uh, it's sort of the broad overview questions because the detailed questions by and large come out of the uh, budget book and questions asked about what's already in the budget book. Uh, that seem where people are at. Uh, Kathy and then Mary Lou. Uh, maybe in, for what for what Lynn is for what Lynn is uh, recommending. Where when we're looking at calendar and say, okay, where was it? Where's there's another day? Um, it looks pretty hard. Maybe we could be disciplined for each of the times we meet to preserve a half an hour at the end where we try to come to a group 
these are the main things we heard or these are the things that are, would be worth reporting out in a report so we can do some highlights as we go through each of those days that would both ha help with the first draft with the draft of this and then on the ninth if we scheduled if people were willing to schedule that to be a three-hour meeting rather than a one hour a two-hour meeting to have a thorough discussion that way we're more likely to get a, re a draft report back on the 14th that at least has had initial thoughts from all of us. So it would be summarized at the end of each meeting, you know, have us go around and then on the 9th, add, a, add an hour to that meeting, which is the last of the focus meetings, so that Andy has more to work with. And I, he usually shares a draft with me and I do my best to take notes as we're going on, you know, to add things that are missing or expand on it so that might be a way of getting that kind of input toward a report that has um not too much detail but high level kinds of things to focus uh, the larger council on um i'm going to recognize two other people who have asked speak and just comment on that there's two ways to go about it. One is to do it at the end of each meeting. The other is to say, to use for example, today you were taking over on libraries and Mary Lou was doing schools to have you um, sort of summarize what you thought you heard before we meet on Thursday and have that be part of the, the, the segment of the meeting on Thursday where um, you kind of uh, make your presentation to us. That's just an alternative. Mary Lou. Well, I, in the past, when you did this last year, how large a document is this? Is it a few pages? Is it similar to the Finance Committee report to town meeting? Um, and, and one of the things I think would be helpful, not maybe not this year, but if the entire council had the complete school uh, budget. Do they? I know they have the managers, which was wonderful. It's superb. And the schools is also, do they get, do you get the school budget in its entirety? Because if you did, then you can make the report to the council short because they should be able to, and they should be able to refer to those documents based on your, your recommendations. But this year, I, I'm not sure if they didn't get the school report, there's a lot of information in there that they don't have. It's a good question. Uh, it certainly did on the regional schools because we had a separate um, hearing that was focusing solely on regional schools and uh, the superintendent presented at that meeting. Uh, so that was before them and I think we heard Therefore, some fairly high level questions from one of the counselors last night about issues in the regional budget and uh, specifically what if the uh, Chapter 70 aid to the region ended up being less than had been projected in the budget. Uh, we, last year we got, for elementary, we got a very thick report from the schools, um, similar to what was the March report. It was much larger, Mary Lou, finance did. And then the town manager posted it and posted it, um, the regional, along with the town budget. So we could make sure we have that document as part of the um, packet for finance, and then we could point people to it. Um, you know, so we, we got one that went into enrollment trends. We talked about, uh, choice in, choice out, charter had a section. So it, it's more similar to what you saw two years ago, but that's what we saw last year. And this was just, I think we were getting people who have done budgets twice, you know, had to redo a whole budget that they had just done, but there is that larger document. Um, so there's no reason not to make that part of the finance packet and also part of a background packet for the entire council. So um, just point out, we don't necessarily need to even wait because um, I think that Sean um, could take the library budget, which we 
definitely have, and I think we have um, the school budgets and put them out to the council um, outside of the meeting, just saying that the finance committee requested that these be made available as the equivalent to the town manager's budget or supplement to the town manager's budget. And we don't really need to even wait to do that if there's agreement on the committee that's, that's something we want to recommend. Uh, Dorothy? So again, this is on process. Um, I have a small section, community services. I assume that I will read it very carefully. I will make a list of questions. Am I allowed to speak to any of the people who run any of these agencies? Or do I give a list of written questions to Paul? Um, because just to look at the paper without talking to people isn't that much to me, but, or do I just come to the finance committee meeting and the staff people are at that finance committee meeting and then I ask my questions amongst those of other members. Then do I write a written report, which it was suggested a few minutes ago that you would then bring it to the beginning of the next meeting, but now there will be no meeting after my doing it. So I'm really asking more minutian questions from what Mary Lou's asking. What is the process that you want me to follow? And I will do it. Yes, Sean. I think in terms of the questions, um, if you get questions to Paul or myself, we will forward them to the, the appropriate department heads and then they can come prepared to address those questions. And then in addition, you can also ask obviously follow up questions or other questions when they come in per, um, when they're there. Um, but if there are any questions, especially if there are in depth questions that you want a, a thorough response, um, if you can get them to us ahead of time, Paul and I can make sure that they get them. What about do I do some written notes on this or does Andy do it from the uh, transcripts? Do you expect something written from the counselors? I think that's something we're trying to work out, but okay. uh, I was wondering if we wanted to have each of the members of the committee take a little bit more uh, responsibility for the sections that they're becoming familiar with. Um, which was kind of the model of the old finance committee. Uh, we didn't do it last year because it was all new to us. Um, I'm trying to see if we can develop a process that okay. is right as we kind of evolve into our second year and set a pattern for how this is to go for future years. Um, Mary Lou, you have some sure. thoughts? Um I, I think your suggestion is a good one that we each take responsibility, but we also had, as you recall, on the finance committee, kind of a little format so that we aren't all over the place. And then in addition to the chair uh, reviewing that with someone in town hall, there was I think three people read the, the drafts and, and made sure that they all kind of flowed together. So I think it's a good, um, a good plan. It worked, um, and it certainly doesn't put the whole burden on the chair, although in the end, the person is responsible because they have to pull it all together. Yes, yeah, Sean. Um, you may, you got, I'm not familiar with the exact detail of how the finance uh, committee recommendations have worked in the past. Um, one idea you might want to consider is um, a component of the report, at least just uh, aligning with what our budget guidelines were and how well the budget document based on the presentations um, and what you hear from different departments, how well the overall budget aligns with what was in the budget guidelines. I think that would be one approach you could take to say, you know, here's what we asked um, the town manager to do. And after talking with the departments, asking questions, you know, he sat, he did this, this, and this, or didn't do this or that, um, that might be one piece of your recommendation that you could um, incorporate. And I think that would be something that would make sense going forward. Okay, yeah, that's, thank you. So why don't we do this? Um, I'll make a suggestion and see if we, um, how people feel about it. And that is that, uh, between now and Thursday, just by email that Mary Lou, Kathy and I 
uh, Mary Lou, because of her prior experience as chair of the old finance committee, Kathy and I as the chair and vice chair currently come up with a uh, quick outline as Mary Lou was suggesting of how we might frame the discussion of each department to see if we can prevent, present this for Thursday for the equivalent follow-up discussion. And uh, then uh, we'll use that because uh, that also involves Kathy and Mary Lou, who are the uh, coincidentally the kind of the lead people in library and schools um, to see also how that um, would work against information that they feel we obtained in today's meeting. Pat? Yeah, you're looking at them providing information from today's meeting. I'm presenting on Thursday. Um, are you saying that I would be using this format? And if so, I need a I need to see it. I, I think we're talking about a post meeting, Pat. Yep, so after, okay. after that, I got it. Yeah. So if that's a uh, workable process, then I'll uh, work with uh, Kathy and Mary Lou immediately to see if we can. It'll just be an outline. It's not going to be more than that, um, but something to present back for Thursday. And. Uh, Paul? So, you know, I was looking at your report that you did last year. Are you looking at something different than what you did last year for the finance committee report or something similar to that, which is about an eight page report? Uh, I don't think it's going to be much longer than last year. I think that what we did last year if, uh, was the sections on departments were uh, not very routine they were and they were not written in a team concept as we've talked about so we're really talking about trying to strengthen that section of the report okay. but i will pull the report back out and send it around to the committee again so that people don't need to look for it uh, thank you and, uh, so anything else and if not then uh, i think we i have nothing else that I can think of that we need to cover. Is there anything else under unanticipated business that uh, anyone else from the committee wishes to raise? And if not, then I'm gonna um, thank you all. It's been a long meeting, but I think a very good and productive meeting and uh, consider ourselves adjourned. Yes, uh, Paul. I just wanna wish um, Happy New Year to Sonia. It's uh, it's the end of the fiscal year today. She'll probably <laughs> go out and get sloppy drunk and you know, <laughs> New Year starts tomorrow. <laughs> yes, Sonia. I wish happy happy New Year, Sonia. Sonia. <laughs> okay, so we're adjourned at uh, five after five. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>